Hello, everyone, and welcome to day two of the International Conference on Ivermectin for COVID. I'm Dr. Tess Laurie of the Evidence-Based Medicine Consultancy and the British Ivermectin Recommendation Development Group, joining you from Bath on a glorious sunny day. Yesterday, we heard from researchers and statisticians who have evaluated the compelling evidence on ivermectin, and from Dr. Dave Chesler, who presented amazing data from his clinical experience of using ivermectin among the elderly in residential homes. Today, we will hear from many frontline clinicians around the world of their research and experience of utilizing ivermectin among people with COVID. And we're fortunate to have the wonderful Dr. Bean with us to chair the meeting. I'll pass you over to him without further ado. Thank you very much, Dr. Laurie. Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to one more jam-packed day and star-studded day with awesome, amazing doctors. They are the ones who are leading on the front lines at this time, saving humanity, using all the available uh, methods and the prescriptions and the drugs that are necessary to help. So let's start looking at the day today. So I'm gonna share my screen. So just as a reminder, this is the International Ivermectin Conference for COVID 24 and 25th April. Today is the second day. If you would like to help us, here are some hashtags to use. You can also help further. This is the website. So please note of the website, it is bird-group.org. And then there is a website for the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Alliance here as well, which is covid19criticalcare.com. Especially if you're looking for ivermectin prophylaxis or the dosage, this is an important site to go to. So with this, let's now have the introduction to our esteemed guests today. So check out this roundup. So first we'll have Professor Eli Schwartz from Israel. He is the director of the Center for Geographic Medicine at Sheba Medical Center in Tel Hashmor, Israel. First introduced the field of travel medicine to Israel. His practice became the recognized center by the Ministry of Health of Israel for tropical and travel diseases. Dr. Schwartz, Professor Schwartz, is currently serving as the president of the Israeli Society of Parasitology and Tropical Disease and past president of the Asia Pacific Travel Health Society. He's a, he's a full professor, clinical, at the Sacker Faculty of Medicine, Tel Aviv University. So we welcome Dr. Eli Schwartz as well. After him, Dr. Pierre Corey. I think you all have heard of him in one way or the other. Dr. Corey is a board certified in internal medicine, critical care, and pulmonary medicine. He's the former chief of the critical care service and medical director of the Trauma and Life Support Center, while an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin. Prior to this, he served as the program director of a, of a pulmonary and critical care fellowship training program at Mount Sinai Beth Israel in New York City. Dr. Corey is also considered a pioneer and national international expert in critical care ultrasound and is the senior editor of a best-selling textbook on the subject, which is in the second edition and has been translated into five languages and has won the President's Choice Award from the British Medical Association in 2015. Dr. Corey also considered a master educator and has won multiple major departmental teaching awards at each institution that he has served as a faculty. After Dr. Corey, we'll have Dr. Wasif Khan with us. He is Enteric and Respiratory Infection Specialist, Infectious Disease Division, International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research, Bangladesh. Then we'll have Dr. Hector Carvalho, Neti Professor, University Abierta Interamericana, Argentina, Ivermectin and Keraginan in the prevention of COVID-19. Professor Carvalho is a former professor of medicine at the University of Buenos Aires, as well as the former director of the Aziza Public Hospital in Argentina. Currently, he's involved in the development of strategies to defeat SARS-CoV-2 and has been a vocal advocate of ivermectin. Recently, he was appointed as the editor-in-chief of the newly released OAJ Research and Applied Medicine. After Dr. 
Carvalho, we have Dr. Tina Pierce. Dr. Tina Pierce, with a background in general practice, became a consultant in contraception and reproductive health care in 1997-96. She then led the contraception and sexual health service for Surrey for 24 years. She became a key opinion leader in contraception and lectured both nationally and internationally. She gained her menopause special, specialist qualification whilst working at Gelwest. She now runs the menopause consultancy concentra concentrating on women's health. For the last six years, she has had an interest in mast cell activation syndrome and histamine intolerance sparked by diagnosis of her daughter in 2016. Since then, she has helped many patients with this condition to improve their health and quality of life. More lately, she has been treating long COVID patients. So for this is an important topic today, uh, mast cell activation. So please keep an eye on this one, especially for the long COVID. Then we would have Dr. Manjul Mehdi. Dr. Mehdi has been working as a consultant in infectious disease at Fourth Valley Royal Hospital since October 2017. Since that time, he has been part of the small team setting up a brand new infectious disease and OPAT surface service. He has previously worked as a junior doctor in several ID departments in the UK, including Aberdeen, Fries, Newcastle, Liverpool, Manchester, and in London. As well as an interest in service development, he also has an interest in medical education and has previously worked for the University of Aberdeen for two years as a clinical teaching fellow. And last but not least, we have Professor Matthias Zwitter, MD, PhD, head of the Department of Medical Ethics and Law, Medical Faculty, University of Maribor, Slovenia. His two papers on ivermectin for COVID-19, as published in Slovenian medical journal ISIS and in leading newspaper, Delo, stirred a vivid debate among medical and lay community, hopefully leading to a change in the current medical practice. He was co-editor of two books on communication, Communication with the Cancer Patient, Information and Truth, the New York Academy of Sciences, 1997, and New Challenges in Communication with Cancer Patients, Springer, 2013. He also wrote and published three books talking about the medical ethics in Slovenian language, Kanker Jiva Zolozoba, 2018, Medical Ethics in Clinical Practice, Springer, 2019, and talking on euthanasia in Slovenian language, Slovenska Matica 2019. So with this, at the end of the discussion, we will have, we will have comments from Dr. Teslori. I would summarize the um, day, and then we would discuss how to move forward, where to find the uh, videos that are recorded. Having said that, let's start. So our first rock star, for today, Dr. Professor Eli Schwartz from Israel. Please take it away, doctor. So thank you very much for the introduction. I will share screen. Yes, okay, so uh, as was mentioned, uh, I'm from the Tropical Institute uh, in uh, Sheba Medical Center, which is the largest hospital in Israel. And for a long time, for several months, we are doing this uh, study on ivermectin versus placebo to treat non-hospitalized patients with COVID-19. And this is a double-blind randomized controlled trial. And, uh, and now we are really at the final, final end of the study. So I will show you the, our results. Uh, it got uh, <clears throat> the IRB from our hospital, from the Ministry of Health of Israel, and it's also registered in the clinical trial gov. So you have here the number of all people who want to follow it or to see more details, uh, you can go and look into it as well. Uh, now, the study. The primary, uh, the objective of the study was to see whether, I mean, we were looking, it was, we started to look for this study at uh, early March last year. And uh, we were looking for a drug which can reduce the viral shedding at the beginning, at the onset of the disease, because it may <clears throat> break the uh, trans uh, transmission chain. 
And this is the, uh, the main objective was really to see whether the ivermectin can do the job. We also thought about evaluating the effect of ivermectin on prevent progression of, uh, for, <clears throat> of clinical disease to, to prevent this severity and the need for hospitalization. However, quite soon at the beginning, we noticed that more than 90, 95% of patients do not deteriorate and our sample size is not going to really help to give uh, a solution for this aspect. So we are mainly, uh, our main concern is really whether ivermectin can reduce the viral shedding. Uh, the study design, we are talking about non-hospitalized uh, patients and as we mentioned, randomized control, double blind trial, and the setting was uh, unique, or maybe not only in Israel, but we have in Israel, people who, has, uh, who have verified diagnosis of COVID-19 and cannot be isolated at home, uh, they are sent to dedicated hotels. And therefore we thought that in this facility, it will be quite easy to recruit patients and to complete the study very quickly. That was kind of illusion because people not really run to participate in any control study. They were looking more maybe for vaccine, but not for drugs. And therefore it took for a long time to complete uh, the study. The study was aimed to deal with adult population, everybody older than 18 years old. We didn't want to deal with children because then we need the parents to sign the uh, consent. And uh, we didn't want to include pregnant women because the safety of the drug is not well known. So all uh, otherwise, all, uh, everybody older than 18 can be uh, included, doesn't matter what his medical situation. And the other point is that since we decided to look for viral shedding, uh, asymptomatic patient could be included as well, because the main point is to follow them and to see whether the uh, level, the viral load is decreasing more quickly in those uh, taking ivermectin com compared to placebo. The other point which uh, we thought at the beginning to recruit the patients quite early uh, during the disease, after the disease onset, and it means within three days. However, at least in the first wave of the pandemic, and the study was started in the, at the end of our first wave, it took time. It took time until the patients decided to go to be checked. It was about two to three days. And then it took another about three, sometimes even four days until they get the reply uh, of the uh, result of the <clears throat> nasopharyngeal swab. And therefore to have patients within 72 hours uh, became kind of illusion. And therefore we extended it and we uh, <clears throat> included uh, patients less than one week from symptoms onset or from diagnosis for patients who had no symptoms. Uh, the intervention, uh, we decided to give ivermectin for three days and we uh, decided to give it in the same, more or less the same dose that we used to give it for uh, parasitic disease. It means 0.2 milligram per kilo. So you can see that people 40 to up to 70 kilo received four tablets per day, but for three days. And people over 70 kilo, they received five tablets again for three days. The other point which I want to highlight that in this study, it was double blind with identical placebo. I'm saying it because some of the recent published uh, data uh, were done without a comparator of placebo, just standard of care, which it's more easy to be biased. And in some, uh, in one, at least in one study, which was done in South America, they did placebo, but the placebo was so easily be uh, identified. So it was not really kind of a placebo. So here we're talking the same appearance and same taste for both uh, uh, ivermectin and placebo. The follow-up uh, was for 14 days because at the early stage of the pandemic, the isolation time was at least for 14 days. And then uh, people were asked to have two negative uh, PCR test. 
And uh, we, therefore, we decided to follow them for 14 days and then by telephone to know what's happened later on until one month. And we decided to follow them with a con <coughs> repeated PCR testing every two days. We decided to start it on day six. That means if they're taking the drug for three days, so we have to wait another three days and then to see whether the viral load is uh, whether the virus disappearing or at least significantly decrease. And therefore we decided to do it at day six, eight, 10, etc. During the pandemic, it became obvious that after 10 days, people are no more infectious and no, no, in many countries, there's no need for further isolations. And therefore people left the hotels much earlier that was, uh, <clears throat> than was expected. And therefore we added two measurements to additional measurements on day two and on day four. I'm saying it because for these two days, which become later on very crucial, we don't have, uh, the sample size is not uh, big enough. Talking about the sample size. So we decided, uh, or we calculated, or decided, calculated that uh, on day six, according to the data that we have from the Ministry of Health, about 90% of people still are positive. And we were looking about 25 decrease in positivity rate, which means from 90% to 67%. And for this, uh, we uh, found that we need 48 patients in each uh, arm. So it's total 96 uh, patients. We thought about people who will drop down. And finally, we recruited 116 patients. Unfortunately, too many patients were dropped out because either we found them, we repeated upon finding them, allocated them in the hotels, we repeated the PCR testing, and we found many of them to be PCR negative. And some of them declined from the uh, study. So altogether, the bottom line is that we have the final numbers are ivermectin 47 and the placebo 42 patients. Uh, here's the reason why they were dropped out. They're not so important now. The in <coughs> Let's go for the results. The important point is that if you look to the comparison between the two groups, the ivermectin and the placebo, so the numbers are slightly uh, different, but all parameters like age, how many of them were older than 50 or even older than 60 that the risk factor is increasing? How many of them have uh, had other risk factors like diabetes, hypertension, etc.? The gender, weight, the percentage of asymptomatic, all of them had a similar uh, number. So do you see there's no significant difference between the two groups. The other important and interesting finding is that uh, the recruitment time post on symptom onset was also quite similar. And you see it took about four days, the mean time to catch them for four days from symptom onset. And this happened in both uh, groups. So let's go now and see the results, the actual results. So here, what you can see is the viral load. Uh, usually you get results in CT value. There's a special way how to translate it to viral load. And here you can see in the red box, this is the ivermectin group, which is quite similar. This is day zero, quite similar to the uh, placebo group. And then you see that when we time start to move on, you see that the ivermectin, the viral load is decreasing more rapidly compared to the placebo. And you see it mainly on day two and on day six, on day four, and day six, later on, you start to see that they became equal. And this just represent the natural history of the disease that placebo, even without treatment, if there's no any severe complications, if there are no severe complications, they will be healed. And therefore this part is usually you see that there's no any advantage for the ivermectin. The main advantage, the main, <clears throat> the main change you see it at the early stage of the disease. And that will teach us that when we talk about the practice of giving ivermectin, 
as soon as you give it, you may get better results. So this was the viral load. The main point is to see how many people become negative. And uh, again, the cutoff of the machine, let's call it, is city level more than 40. But this to reach this city level may take for three to four weeks. However, during the pandemic, we learned more about the natural history of the disease. And we learned that in city level of 30 and more, people mostly, almost 100% of them become non-infectious. And this is the most important part for the whole managing of the pandemic. You want the people, the infected people to be non-infectious for their environment. So we decided to go and look for the negative sample at the level of CT value above 30. And now you can see what's happened. So if you see, uh, we started from day four to calculate. Day four means one day after termination of treatment. Remember, the ivermectin treatment or placebo work for three days. So if you see the odds ratio, you see that all of them is um, about 2.5 or even more in favor of the ivermectin. Ivermectin is doing much better compared to placebo. However, in day four, due to the limited number of patients, we don't get significant <coughs> numbers. However, on day six, which was the primary endpoint, you see that it's significant. Day eight, it's significant. And then later on, it's, it's <laughs> declining because again, as we mentioned before, the placebo are doing quite well and <coughs> heal themselves without any assistance from us. So this is the negativity rate, or, or we can say here that on day six, uh, we see quite clear the advantage of taking ivermectin compared to uh, placebo. If we do multivariant analysis, we get the same, the same answer that we see that there is no any impact of the gender, no impact of age, weight, symptoms, yes or not. However, if you look to the uh, giving ivermectin, it gives you 2.6 higher chance to be negative compared to placebo. So this is highly significant. And this actually was the point that we wanted to uh, see uh, in people being treated with ivermectin. The last point at this stage, we did Kaplan-Meier analysis and we did it about symptomatic patients so we can see the timeline. And you see here, this is the symptoms onset. Remember, about four days it took them to reach to us and to be included in the study. And then here is the intervention started. And you see that within about two days after initiating treatment, you can see the difference. And the blue line is the line of ivermectin, which became negative much faster compared to the red line, which is the uh, placebo. So this was the, <clears throat> uh, actually the main findings of uh, this part of the study. As I mentioned to you, clinical deterioration, we, from the beginning, we uh, noticed that it cannot be fulfilled, but just to show you, we have, for example, we have four patients who were hospitalized. Three out of the four were placebo, compared to one of ivermectin who actually uh, was taken to be checked in the hospital a few hours after giving him ivermectin. So you cannot say even this related to ivermectin. In fact, after a few hours, he was, son he was sent back to the hotel because he so quickly uh, recovered. Uh, there was one asymptomatic patient who, who changed switch to be symptomatic and this was happened in the placebo group. So all these numbers are maybe kind of trend, but it's far from being statistically significant. And there's no doubt that there is a need to do a good study to see high-risk patients, whether if they are taking 
ivermectin, we can prevent the deterioration to hospitalization, need for oxygen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The safety of the drug. So actually, there was no safety issues uh, in this uh, cohort. We have, as you see, three people with diarrhea. Two of them took the ivermectin, one with placebo. In both of them, diarrhea resolved within one or two days. And again, nobody really know it might be part of the disease. Two patients has uh, one, of, uh, one to two days of rash, which also subsided spontaneously. And both of them uh, took the placebo. So altogether, despite, <coughs> despite the fact that patients took slightly higher dose compared to the dosage that we use in daily life for parasitic disease, there was no any safety, safety issues of this drug, which again, for us in the tropical uh, arena, who use this drug in almost daily life, we know that really there are no safeties, uh, safety issues with the drug. So for conclusion at this part, ivermectin really demonstrated an anti-SARS-CoV-2 activity, which we wanted to show. And in this case, that it reduced viral shedding, it shortened the infectivity time, and it really part of the, it's important for the public health point of view. And we thought that this will be the end of the study. However, luckily, at the end, toward the end of our study, uh, Something happened in our uh, institute and uh, biosafety level three le uh, was opened. So we decided since all the positive samples were kept, were stored in man minus 80 Celsius, that we can try to see the viability of the culture and to see whether patients who were treated with ivermectin will have less viable culture compared to placebo. And we have to remember the viable culture these days is really the best surrogate marker for infectivity. So let's see. Uh, you do the uh, in vitro study. Uh, you, uh, you have these uh, cell lines, usually it's vero cell. And then you put, uh, you take the medium which was kept stored and you put a certain amount of it on each uh, well, and you see whether you get after one week, usually, if you get any growth of the uh, virus. Uh, we took only samples below CT of 30 because we know the experience for us and many other that in CT value above 30, the chance to get positive uh, culture is almost uh, none. And we uh, checked the samples four and six days post intervention. Now, let's see, it's interesting, it's nicely done. The way it is, uh, uh, it is done, see for example, uh, patient number 147. On day four of intervention, we took nasopharyngeal swab and the CT level was 25, so it's uh, <coughs> significant positive. Then after being in the culture for, in this case, for 10 days, you see that the CT level dropped dramatically to five. And for people who are not familiar with these numbers, as CT level drop down, it means that the viral load is much higher. So the viral load here is much higher compared to the original, uh, <clears throat> the original number, which original load, which was when we diagnosed him. On the other hand, if you see patient number 141, the same, the nasopharyngeal swab was taken on day four, the CT levels was 23, and after being in the culture for more than a week, nothing happened, even slightly less. So this is a negative uh, <clears throat> culture, this is positive culture. So now let's see the results, and you can see that on this um, study of four to six days, all the uh, samples that we finally could recover, retrieve them, you see that among the placebo group, six out of 18 tested positive. That means about one third, 33% were positive compared to ivermectin, which only 7%, one in 14 samples, we're taking. So this is not the end. Uh, we are hoping to get more results now for day two. 
and we hope that the, the growing sample size will give much more significant results. But here you can see a solid data on the, I would say, direct effect of ivermectin on uh, cell cultures. So uh, if now we take a composite calculation, that means we take non-infectious samples, which is uh, based on either CT value above 30, as we mentioned earlier, and taking also those below 30, but non-viable culture, all of these samples we know should be considered as a non-infectious. So we said we can see that on day six, more than 90% of the samples become negative, And this is highly significant compared to, to placebo. So now, if I will conclude, I would say that beside the fact that anti that ivermectin demonstrate an anti uh, SARS-CoV-2 activity, it really has a significant public health impact. It may block transmission chain, and therefore we should continue to do uh, do other studies, like as I mentioned before, see whether it can prevent deterioration to hospitalization and the need for uh, oxygen or intubation. We should further check it for prophylaxis, but I would say that based on my study, on our study, it significantly can shorten the isolation time. So I would say my dream now is that if we have a verified patient, he can be, he should be isolated and maybe take three days of ivermectin and do day fourth, to be checked if CT value above 30, he can be uh, released from isolation. And this is a major change. I mean, we have to remember isolation is a heavy burden for the economics, from the social point of view. And I think our study gave a good uh, lesson or more than a hint that it might be uh, with this drug, we can shorten the isolation time. So thank you for listening to me and if there are any comments, questions, I'm here. Thank you very much, Dr. Schwartz. What a wonderful study. And thank you very much for the great results that you shared. We have a few questions, if you're ready. Um, a couple of questions are the following. One question that I'm looking at it here, it's a, it is from Roberta. And they are saying that, Dr. Schwartz, this study results was used for some public health mass strategy in Israel or not? Is it? used to change any strategies? Uh, I can say that fortunately in Israel, there's no need. I mean, uh, due to the massive uh, vaccine campaign, actually we don't have uh, cases now. And even the studies which I mentioned to you that I would like to continue, I can't do it these days in Israel. So in Israel, there's no, uh, this is not the place to, to check it, but I mean, the rest of the world, it's still in uh, under disaster situation. And uh, I hope people will use it. And by the way, congratulations for controlling the outbreak in Israel. So of course, the whole medical community, the vaccination people, this, you've done a great job. Uh, one more question here, that is from Laurie Patrick. What did placebo, why did placebo cause symptoms? Oh, it's happened many, I, I can't say that placebo caused symptoms. We said that people who were on the arm of placebo had symptoms. You have to remember that diarrhea can be part of the disease. Rash can be also part of the COVID disease. So nobody can say that it's really related to placebo, but absolutely you cannot blame and say that ivermectin, people taking ivermectin had more uh, kind of side effects compared to, uh, to placebo. Got it. Couple of more questions and possibly quick ones. One is from Edmund Fordham, and they are saying, what was the definition of asymptomatic patient? Positive PCR with no symptoms is likely a false positive unless low cycle threshold value, multi-gene detection or confirmed on repeat. I note many dropouts were found PCR negative or on repeat. 
No, first of all, you have to remember that uh, positive PCR is hardly you get it as a false positive. To get false negative is very common, but to get false positive is uncommon. That's one thing. The second is uh, you can ask how come the people who are completely asymptomatic, why they did check themselves. So usually the story is that one of the family member had the disease, verified disease, and then the other go to be checked. And then you find them and many times the CT value can be equal to people with severe symptoms. And actually, I, I think uh, there is a question about what is CT level. So uh, if it's okay, I will briefly answer. Uh, the, please do. Uh, <coughs> uh, CT means uh, a cycle threshold. That means, I mean, the whole point of the PCR uh, system is that you multiply, you start with a small amount of virus, you start to multiply it. And each cycle, you're doubling it. So if you need to double it many, many times, you get high CT value, but it means that the mass of virus that you started with was very, very low. On the other hand, if you have a high volume, high load of virus, there's no need to do many cycling until you find the positive results and therefore lo low CT value equivalent to high uh, viral load. Got it. So thank you very much. One last question. Uh, so this question is uh, also from, a, from an audience member here. Liver cirrhosis and ivermectin. Is ivermectin contraindicated or should the dose be adjusted in a patient of liver cirrhosis? Uh, it has metabolism in the liver, so I guess it should be modified. I must say I'm not familiar. Usually our patients don't suffer from uh, end-stage liver disease, so uh, I don't Professor Schwartz, I, I, can, uh, I can answer that one. Yeah. The, uh, actually, I, I was going to talk about it in my talk, but the, the actual insert uh, for, the, for ivermectin says that dose adjustment is not required in liver disease. Excellent. Okay. So thanks. thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Cody and Dr. Schwartz. Thank you, Professor Schwartz. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for sharing the study results, beautiful results. And once again, congratulations in Israel to be on the path for, you know, opening up the society back again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, you're welcome. So for the audience, our next uh, rock star who just actually make his brief appearance. Dr. Pierre Cori, I mentioned his, uh, I described his bio before. Uh, he has been on the forefront of ivermectin. I think in, in many ways we can actually say that he has been the tipping point for ivermectin to actually start gaining traction that you are seeing now. I know that this traction is not sufficient, but the growth, the ball that is rolling at this time uh, Dr. Pierre Cori, Dr. Teslari, Bird Group, they're all actually very, very important in this. And the panelists who are here today, they are the ones who are actually keeping life in this and saving humanity. One uh, quick note for the audience, please write your questions in the Q&A window instead of the text. It is actually difficult to find them from the text and bring them in here. So with this, without any further delay, let's listen in from Dr. Pierre Cori. So uh, I've been asked to talk about treatment protocols. So I'm going to present the protocols that uh, myself and um, my colleagues in the uh, Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance, that's the, uh, the nonprofit that we formed. Uh, and although now we, we're so attached to ivermectin, I, I'd like to remind everyone that we've really been we formed a year ago to, to really just promote effective treatment protocols. Uh, ivermectin came on to our attention only about four or six months ago. So um, I'm uh, lucky to be president, although I, anytime I say that, I call out Professor Paul Marek, my friend, my colleague, my mentor, because he really is the one who brought us together uh, to form the alliance. And, uh, you know, I would say he and I are probably the two that most... Um, most have uh, developed the protocols. I say, you know, we, we borrowed protocols that Paul used uh, for sepsis and we've adapted and added to it uh, through our reading and understanding of the pathophysiology of COVID. Uh, and one of my favorite things to do is argue with Paul about uh, dosing strategies and drug strategies. Um, so um, 
The other thing I want to talk about is the protocols that I'm going to present today. So we really, I guess, would have three, right? And we're actually working on a fourth. It's going to be a partnership with Dr. Bean, actually. Uh, we're going to be working on a long haul uh, COVID protocol, which we'll probably have uh, sometime next week. Uh, but right now we have a prophylaxis or prevention protocol, uh, and then an early outpatient protocol, as well as a hospital one. Um, our hospital one's been around the longest. We are critical care doctors. Although now I'm treating patients in all phases. I've been treating numbers, numbers of outpatients for the last four to six months. Um, they, they get to me. So I'm having a lot of outpatient experience. Um, but these are brand new. So we've just added a few elements. I'm going to talk about them, but the, probably the easiest one to talk about is our prevention protocol. Um, we just made a change. Um, we used to dose uh, every two weeks. Um, actually, now, I'm um, sorry, I have a, there's a little bit of a mistake. We just were finishing this this morning. Um, actually, for high-risk individuals, we are now um, recommending to dose weekly, like Dr. Carvalho's protocol. Um, we had done it every two weeks, uh, mostly because we were pretty impressed with the monthly data, um, as well as the weekly data, and we were sort of thinking about re resource allocation. And also, we didn't really have good safety data uh, for long-term use. But now that it's uh, many people in prophylaxing for a year, we have not come across any uh, late phase side effects. And so we think it's quite safe. And really, the best effects are weekly. So although it's mis, uh, uh, miswritten here, the prevention for high-risk individuals, those, those that are older or comorbidities, um, it's really weekly. And then the post-exposure prophylaxis is actually one dose uh, on the day that uh, you know you're you you find out that you've been exposed, and then you repeat another dose in 48 hours. And so uh, that's what we do for post exposure, and then for chronic prophylaxis, um, we we advocate uh, every week. And then we also have a number of uh, supplements that we know are help uh, the immune system optimize and protect yourself from respiratory viruses. Um, and so that's our prevention. Now the early outpatient protocol. We've had ivermectin. In fact, we, we, we uh, first put together a protocol because of ivermectin. So when we put it together back in sort of October, November, it's because, you know, we, you know, Paul identified a, a pretty impressive data signal around ivermectin. This is after about three or four studies. Now we have dozens and dozens, and it's still argued about. But uh, we were impressed with the first early ones, and we, we came up with a protocol centered around ivermectin. We've now just added two other elements. One is fluvoxamine, and then also nasal pharyngeal sanitation. Now, the nasal pharyngeal sanitation, I'll talk about in a second, um, that doesn't have a lot of data around it, but it has very supportive and interesting data, and it's pretty harmless. Uh, and we know that you know viral loads are very high in the nasal pharynx, and there is really kind of supportive data showing that if you do uh, you know sanitization of the nasal and oral passages by decreasing that viral load, it would seem that you could decrease the severity and progression uh, of the illness. So we we've put that on. Um, there's a number of ways in which you can do it. Uh, you know, from something as simple as doing like, uh, you know, inhaling steam three times a day with like vapor rub, some essential oils. Um, that's a very good way to neutralize the virus. And then also uh, mouthwash gargles and then even betadine, betadine nasal spray um, is another way to disinfect and, and they're very viricidal. And so you can really reduce viral loads. And so we think that's uh, supportive. The ivermectin, the other thing that we've changed, we always had the standard dose, right, which is 0 0.2 milligrams per kilogram. And, you know, we said uh, a minimum of two days and go out to five if you're not fully recovered. Uh, many people, if you, especially if you start early, they recover fairly quickly. But now we're actually increasing the dose uh, for a few reasons. Dr. Hill's data showing a pretty strong dose response in terms of uh, time to viral clearance as well as time to clinical recovery. Um, and then also we're just getting, you know, I'm, I'm in contact with doctors all over the world and we're hearing uh, that in some of these more aggressive variants that the standard doses really are underwhelming um, and they're having to use higher doses. So we actually are putting up our range to 0 0.4. And even myself, I've had a number of cases recently where uh, I did not get the same responses that I have been with the standard dose which worked well for me for quite a few months and I've had to double the dose. And so uh, we're actually putting up a higher range. We give some indications of when you'd wanted to use a higher range. The other thing that we've been doing is uh, the fluvoxamine evidence base is pretty strong. 
um, relatively harmless at these doses. And we are now, uh, I've been using it for my more severe cases, cases where patients get to me after five days and they're a little bit farther along or in the pulmonary phase. Um, I add fluvoxamine and that's uh, the dose is from the uh, Ceftel study where he modified uh, the dose from the lens study. Anyway, we do 50 milligrams PO twice daily. I say 10 to 14. Uh, they did 14 in that, but I don't know why you'd go out to 14. If you get better and, and you've recovered relatively easier, I think you could stop earlier. And so um, we have that as an addition to ivermectin in more severe cases, more advanced cases, or numerous comorbidities. Um, we think uh, in combination, uh, it's highly effective at uh, resting this disease. And then obviously we continue on with our supplements. Um, so uh, just briefly, this is from Andy Hill's data. It's actually gotten stronger now. Uh, this only has a handful of studies, but if you could see the treatment effects of single day dosing versus uh, multi-day dosing, and that, that's actually uh, much stronger now in terms of time to viral clearance. In fact, there's 10, uh, 10 of the 13 studies that have measured viral clearance, uh, including Dr. Schwartz's uh, show, uh, multi-day dosing far more uh, impactful than single day. And there's even a signal there for uh, clinical recovery. Obviously, there's only one study here. There's more, uh, and it's consistent for time to clinical recovery. So that's why we're actually, um, not only do we have multi-day dosing, but we've actually increased our dose. Um, fluvoxamine, I'm not going to go over this too much, but there's actually two clinical trials. One was an RCT in JAMA. The other one was more of an observational trial, but there's just a lot of uh, observational and confirming studies. The observational studies from mental hospitals showing that in, in outbreaks in mental hospitals, all the doctors and nurses got sick and very few of the patients. And when they looked at why, it looked like these SSRIs were quite protective. And then the androgen blockade, which I'll talk about in math plus, um, that actually has pretty robust evidence. The one uh, study of proxalutamide, I haven't seen the study yet. It was just more of a press release, but they were reporting mortality that is almost unbelievable. Um, I think the, the, the control group had a 48% mortality it was in the Brazilian variant where they were overwhelmed in Brazil and the treatment arm had like a 3.7. Um, so I'm very interested in seeing that study, uh, but that also seems to be an intervention that's lining up. Um, this is just uh, 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 from one of the experts who did a review of all of the different methods in which you can do uh, nasal pharyngeal or pharyngeal sanitization, the different uh, ways in which you can do that. And so um, we, we favor that. It's pretty harmless and, and uh, likely uh, quite helpful. Um, now let's move on to math plus. So this is a two-parter. So this is one slide. This is the second slide. We got a lot of stuff on here. Um, so this is what we first uh, came to prominence for is that we argued for methylprednisolone and at much higher doses, and I'll explain why in a second, but um, th there's an epidemic of underdosing of corticosteroids in the hospital. Um, we also are experts in the use of ascorbic acid, and so we favor that. And we've been getting really good um, results, especially in late phase severe disease with mega dosing. There's a little bit of literature on that, a case report uh, from um, uh, Beloma in Australia. And we are actually seeing a number of cases of, of pretty much rescue therapy uh, with these mega doses of vitamin C. Thiamine, there was just a study that came out this week, showed a mortality benefit from thiamine and COVID. And then obviously, you know, guys know about uh, anticoagulation with heparin. So we had this down already in March or April of last year. So the math hasn't changed. We have changed our dosing a little bit uh, as far as um, we're much quicker to go to pulse dosing now. And I'll explain why in a second. Um, and then obviously we have ivermectin and here we're actually favoring a higher dose range, 0.4 to 0.6. Um, in the hospital in more severe disease. So it's math plus ivermectin. And then in this slide, we're also adding fluvoxamine like we do in outpatients. And this is where we add the antiandrogens for, for men only, um, either dutasteride, which was in the studies, or finasteride. And we don't have studies on finasteride, but it, it, it should uh, be a, a reasonable substitute. Um, and then obviously we have other... Um, other interventions like statin and then some of our other uh, supportive medicines. Um, the therapeutic plasma exchange is, is another one which I just am so saddened about. It is so highly effective. I have rescued patients by doing plasma phoresis. Um, I've seen turnarounds like you wouldn't believe. The data supporting this in severe cases is overwhelming. Um, I would refer you all to our, our paper on Math Plus, which was published in the Journal of Intensive Care Medicine. I have a whole section 
going over all of the case series and the observational controlled trials of uh, plasma exchange. And it's really a very high, highly effective uh, salvage therapy um, that's underused and not talked about. Um, I want to talk a little bit about steroids. Maybe this is me tooting my own horn. Maybe these are my resentments coming out. But um, I think everybody uh, remembers my testimony in the Senate in December when I talked about the critical need for ivermectin. That was not my first rodeo, as they say. I had already been in the Senate back in May, where I recommended that it's critical that we use corticosteroids in this disease. And I did that at a time where every major national, international body was recommending against steroids. Um, and I got roundly attacked and, and, and uh, um, criticized for this recommendation. Everybody thought it was reckless and that it was gonna hurt people. I was extremely competent. Our team was extremely competent in why we were recommending. And we turned out to be right, right? So six weeks later, after my testimony, the recovery uh, came out uh, showing that, uh, dex that you know, dexamethasone saves lives. Um, I, I was very happy by this, but I'm also saddened. This trial is, oh, I, I think it's, it's it, 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 this is what I say, it helps the few and fails the many. It is a terrible dose of steroids and, and, the, wrong do, and the wrong steroid to use in this disease. And I find it a shame uh, that, the, that the whole world uh, sticks to this protocol of six milligrams of dexamethasone. And I'll tell you why in a second. Now, one of the important reasons why corticosteroids are critical, I'm not gonna get too into this because it gets a little geeky, but remember I'm a lung specialist. And I, I thought these patients, they, it clicked one day as I was seeing these patients that, you know, they remind me of these organizing pneumonia patients. And I'm friends and colleagues with one of the world experts in chest radiology. And I called them up one day and I said, hey, Jeff, do you, would you agree that these patients are all, they all seem to have organizing pneumonia. And for, all the, for those of you guys who don't know what organizing pneumonia is, it's not an infectious disease. Although it's, it's a terribly named disease. It's not an infection. It's just a response to a lung injury. It's a type of inflammation that occurs uh, when the lung is injured. And he told me, he said, of course, it's organized pneumonia. We published this back in March. So last year, not, not March 2013, in March of 2020, the expert panel in radiology, they said that the most common reported CT finding is one of an organizing pneumonia. And the pattern now is described in almost every case. Everybody, when they first hit the hospital, has a pattern of organizing pneumonia. It's a response to a lung injury. And I wrote a paper trying to call attention to the world that this is a pandemic of organizing pneumonia and you needed steroids and you needed high doses of steroids. My paper was roundly rejected by all of the big journals. Uh, it actually went out for peer review at Chest, and the reviewer rejected it, saying my little hypothesis could not be accepted unless I did a big uh, RCT of corticosteroids. Uh, so now, now that the RCT came out, people are starting to say, "Hey, you know, this is we're seeing a lot of organized pneumonia." I have trainees all over the place who text me or call me when they find this paper because I published this paper in BMJ open respiratory research, really showing that in organizing pneumonia, what we've known for years in this disease is you really need to do pulse doses in fulminant cases. They don't get better on these low doses. Six milligrams of dexamethasone is a joke. I'm a pulmonologist. I treat 80 year olds with COPD exacerbations with more steroids than this. These patients are on ventilators with whited out lungs and they're getting six milligrams of dexamethasone. It, it's, it's really, it's, 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 I find it sad and depressing. Literally a year later into this disease, the entire world is giving remdesivir and six milligrams of death. It's embarrassing. It's absolutely embarrassing to show such little knowledge and insight and, and accumulation of experience in treating this disease. And the, the other important thing about organized pneumonia, not only do you need high doses, but there's no preset duration. These patients can relapse. I've had patients discharged from the, from the hospital off oxygen, and they've come back in with fulminant relapses and they've died. People can die if you take them off steroids too early. So my point is you need to treat for longer. You need to follow the disease. There's no preset duration. Um, and you have to watch for, reset, for, for relapse. I treat until they're off oxygen. Then I taper over two to three weeks and I watch for relapse. I have my patients call me immediately if they feel any more recurrence of shortness of breath. Now, this table is what we put together with all the RCTs of steroids in COVID. And if you look here, this is number needed to treat. That's what measures, that's the most potent way to measure the impact of a therapy. And this is the number needed to treat 
to save one life. Look where methylprednisone lines up compared to dexamethasone as well as hydrocortisone. It has the lowest number of needed treat. This trial used the highest doses, 250 milligrams of methylpred daily for three days. And look at this mortality benefit that they realized. Compared to this anemic recovery trial, um, it, it, it's just sad that these patients are being underdosed uh, and they're using the wrong drug. The drug is methylprednisolone and it's at higher doses. Um, and I don't know how long it's gonna take for the world to fill that out. We even now have studies where they've compared the two and both studies show dramatic benefits of methylprednisolone versus the dexamethasone six. This is, an, uh, this is an example of organizing pneumonia as a very characteristic, these well demarcated peripheral ground glass opacities that don't follow anatomic planes um, with all this, this central bronchovascular uh, involvement too. And this was a patient, actually was a doctor, 10 days on heated high flow, 100%, got pulsed and was off to high flow within days. And this is what happened. This is how she got discharged. Um, the last thing I'll say is uh, contraindications. So we, you know, what is the safety of, of, um, of ivermectin? The first thing I want to say is there was a recent uh, sort of big review of 350 reports. It was done by a famous toxicologist in France. Um, and in his review, it's actually on the MedInCell website. He's, his overall conclusion on ivermectin is that severe adverse events are unequiv unequivocally and exceedingly rare. Unequivocally and exceedingly rare. It's an extremely safe drug. The only things you have to watch out for is that we have, a, not everywhere will you find this, but I have heard of an interaction with statins that in rare cases, it could cause rhabdo. Um, with warfarin, it can actually uh, prolong the, uh, the coagulation times. So you have to watch it with warfarin. You might wanna hold it if you're treating together or just do much closer monitoring uh, to make sure that they're not over anticoagulated. Um, transplant medicines are the big ones like tecrolimus, serolimus, and cyclosporin. You really need to met, monitor those levels and you would have to tell uh, their transplant doctors that you're using ivermectin. Um, there's a, the only absolute contraindication is BCG and cholera vaccines. And like I said, there's no contraindication with liver disease. And this idea that it injures the liver, we could only find three cases of hepatitis in the literature, three cases in 40 years. They all self-resolved and one of them was weak. It occurred like a month after treatment. Um, and like I said, the insert says no dose adjustment indicated liver disease. And with that, uh, I'll stop. Thank you for having me. And I hope, uh, hope you guys learned something. Thank you very much, Dr. Corey. Such a great presentation and great work. So it is actually an honor to have you with us. We have a number of questions. So when you're ready. Born ready, Dr. Bean. Excellent. So let's start. So the uh, one question is about clarithromycin oral and usage of oral clarithromycin. Does that somehow interact with the liver enzymes and then increase the dosage of ivermectin? Should we reduce the dose of ivermectin? So um, I'm a little bit ignorant on the interactions of both of them. I do not believe that they interact, number one. Uh, actually, well, actually, the, that's the other thing I should say is that if you look at drugs.com, there's actually a long list of interactions in terms of either the levels of ivermectin will be higher or lower. So always consult you know, that database. Um, if clarithromycin lowers the levels, uh, then yes, you might want to increase the dose of ivermectin or vice versa. I don't use macrolides in this disease. Um, we just, the data has been very underwhelming. I get that there's some pathophysiologic rationale, but we don't use it. Yeah. So th there is uh, a mechanism about the peak glycoprotein, which is a transporter in the liver cells and possibly works with the ivermectin, as you very well are aware. So I think that the right answer is to look at the dogs.com and the interactions over there. Yep. Moving forward, this is an important question. Will the big companies, big, big organizations, big pharma, will they repackage something like an ivermectin molecule with different names <laughs> and then sell them with higher, higher prices? You know, I actually saw that question. Um, <laughs> That's why I asked. <laughs> I mean, the only reason I'm laughing is it's a very good question. It, I wouldn't doubt that pharma would do that. It sounds like 
it, once they realize, uh, or they probably already realize that ivermectin is effective. If it's a pharmaceutical company that doesn't have a, a competing molecule, um, and many do, uh, even AstraZeneca has a couple. Uh, and so it's definitely not going to be AstraZeneca because they have other drugs that they want to bring to market. But if there is a pharma company who wants to um, somehow make, a, I guess, a patentable or a profitable package, it certainly seems like that would be a strategy. I would not be surprised. Dr. Uh, Carvalho, what Pierre, do you think? Uh, well, I think so. And I can give you an example from my country. Uh, there are four companies in Argentina who, uh, who sell ivermectin. One of them have created a new formula concentration, increasing the concentration three times and increasing the price 10 times. <laughs> so it's, it's part of human nature. There's no vaccine against greed. Yeah. Right. <laughs> I'm sorry, I like that statement. But yeah, but yeah that's, I mean, I, when I said it, this would not surprise me if a pharmaceutical company did this, and there's your example. So um, one more example from the US as well, I would not name the company, but recently there has been a drug that is our DRP blocker or disruptor. The mechanism of action is very similar to ivermectin, just keep in mind that ivermectin has five mechanisms. RDRP disruption is one of them, but this new drug only has that one mechanism. So this is happening. Uh, one more question for you, Dr. Corey. Uh, here in our country, US, since this is not yet FDA approved ivermectin, how can we protect our licenses if we are prescribing it? So I'm gonna give a strong answer to that one. Uh, I believe that is an overblown fear. So number one, prescribing something off-label is about as common as the day is long, right? 20% of prescriptions in this country are off-label. So why you would be scared of off-label prescribing of ivermectin makes no sense because you do it all the time. That's number one. Number two, I can't imagine a courtroom or a case in which you would lose, I would come on as an expert witness <laughs> and I would show I would show the pile of data showing that not using ivermectin harms patients in COVID and, and really that it's very well supported with the evidence. Now, the challenge is none of us want to go into a courtroom. Right. And so uh, but I think it would be nearly impossible to get sued for using ivermectin. Do you know how many patients are grateful? How many reams of testimonials and and all the patients that we've treated who you feel better? Hector, what you please please add to that? Uh, well, I, I, I'm here just to interrupt you. Uh, <laughs> uh, the fact the fact is, you have to take, and I'm not talking to you, Pierre, because I I, I know you do know this, but to the audience, first of all, all compounds, these compounds, any other compounds, are meant for cap compassionate use. So if you make the patient or his uh, relatives sign for the compassionate use, no one can ever even dream of suing you. That's compassionate use. And secondly, if you don't want to write so much because doctors are not good writers, uh, or, uh, well, you, you may prescribe it for a uh, possible strongyloidis. And that's it. That's what they do in Argentina. Many doctors prescribe it for parasitic diseases. And I, who can I, blame I like, them? Hector, I like that suggestion. I didn't think of that. You know, if for those that are concerned, I think if you were to show, uh, you know, some of our summaries or our paper to a patient, they would be they would be very swayed that there's sufficient evidence, but you can also protect yourself with having them sign for compassionate use. I think that's fine. I, I don't do it because uh, maybe I'm overconfident, but uh, I, I mean, my patients all they understand I'm an expert in the medicine and in the disease and they trust my judgments. And, and um, I've done nothing but help patients with this protocol. So anyway, well, I, 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 I don't do it either, but I, I'm given j just two possibilities of, gotcha. of using it. If, if some doctors are uh, concerned about their future. And, and I also want to just secondly have to mention that this lack of guidance from the PHAs, the public health agencies all over the world, is a major problem. The fact that doctors have to be worried about their license and about, about being, uh, you know, 
being blamed for something because they can't give good guidance is, is really, it's harming physicians. It's harming patients and physicians. And it's, it's, it's truly sad. So Professor Schwartz, please. Yeah, I just want to, uh, I mean, mentioning uh, strongyloides, I think it's a good point because we have to remember, especially if we are talking about high-risk patients, they may deteriorate to hospitalization and they will need dexamethasone treatment, which become a, a standard of care. Now, you have to remember that all patients who are living in endemic countries for strongyloides, they may be in dangers of strongyloides hyperinfection. So it must be to protect them, you have to give them ivermectin before the dexamethasone. So the fact that somebody is high risk, either he's a traveler returning in his past from endemic countries or is residing now in endemic country, I think it's a good excuse to give anyhow uh, those of ivermectin. Makes sense. And I wanna loop in Dr. Chesler here as well. Dr. Chesler, you have been using ivermectin in some of your centers too. You discussed them yesterday. Uh, how, what is your opinion when you are using it? Um, well, we informed all the responsible parties that we were going to use this medication and explained why I thought it was going to help and that the chances of side effects were so minimal. And they were, everyone was just so excited that somebody was going to do something because they, they all knew what was ahead for their, their loved ones. And so, um, uh, never had any pushback from uh, from families. Got it. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yeah. Lori. How about Britain? Britain. So the same thing. The prescription. I believe that in Britain it is not prescribed very often. How do you see it, uh, Dr. Madhi? If you could uh, chime in as well. Yeah. Can I go next? I mean, I'll be talking about this uh, specifically from the UK NHS perspective in my talk later on. Okay. So we, we'll wait for this one for that. I'm going to switch the question then uh, for I, Dr. Corey. Uh, has been said so far. I just. Um, yeah. So yeah. we'll wait. We'll wait to hear from you. Dr. Corey, I have a question for you. Uh, animal ivermectin. This is such a, a big question and it is an unfortunate situation that because of the fear of the ivermectin or not approval of the ivermectin, people don't get them and then they go and get animal ivermectin. Any comment on that? Good, bad, don't do it, so, no comment. Yeah, so here's the things I have to say on it because you're right, it is, it is a common question. Um, and I'm just gonna give an honest answer. So two things, the differences between uh, animal and human ivermectin is that they're both ivermectin. The human ivermectin, uh, is generally regulated to have very low amounts of impurities. So there's more impurities in the animal forms. Now, are those impurities toxic? We have no evidence that there's toxicities associated with the animal ivermectin. I know the FDA has warned or tried to scare people by saying people have gone to the hospital, but we don't know if they took too much. And even, even if they took too much, you know, we have papers showing that even very high doses, there have been overdoses, accidental overdoses, and people haven't been harmed. Um, so what I say is, although the animal forms we don't have safety data on, we also are not aware of any toxicity with it. But as a group and as a physician, I can't recommend animal ivermectin. We don't have the safety data on it. But at the same time, knowing that we have, uh, we have, we've had very little toxicity data, and maybe Hector, you can speak more about this because I know in South America, especially in Peru, I mean, hundreds of thousands of patients used animal forms of ivermectin. And so I, I know it's commonly used, but I can't personally recommend it. I, I, I know that many people are using uh, the veterinary form uh, all over the world, not only yeah. in South America, but also in Europe. Because in Belgium, uh, uh, they uh, they receive not 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 in Belgium um, in the eastern you, you know Europe has changed after the the drop of the iron ca uh, curtain, but the the fact is it wasn't dropped at all. It was just moved a little bit eastwards, and so the countries that are close to Russia still receive. Uh, ivermectin in the veterinary form, and they use it for human reasons, mainly for the COVID-19. So that happens both in South America and Europe. And the fact is, uh, there's a difference in concentration. The concentration is one 
percent and 0.6 percent if compared with uh, the medical uh, form. And besides, besides the propellant, which is used for injection in a bed, a bed form, hmm? uh, the propellant, which is polyethylene glycol, uh, is maybe toxic for human beings, even if they receive it per os. Have I been clear about that point? Yes. Mm -hmm. I'm more concerned about the propellant used by the veterinarians than from ivermectin itself. Got it. Got it. Thank you very much for this answer. More questions. Uh, Dr. Cody, you ready? Yeah. Next question is from Dr. Resend. He is saying, or they are saying, I see many colleagues using many new medications for the treatment of COVID, for example, rudesteride and et cetera. As the disease already causes liver changes, wouldn't they be overloading other vital organs in addition to liver? Why do I ask? Because I don't use all these new medications. I only treat with ivermectin plus vitamins plus probiotics plus azithromycin. Could talk about this question. Any comment using new drugs overloading liver and other organs? Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, obviously, as, as more data comes, we can be more certain in the safety, but uh, I am not aware of any adverse effects from those antiandrogens, uh, nor fluvoxamine. And that's been both of those are the ones that we've added to our protocols. Um, and I would say if your protocol is working and, and or you're seeing patients early in the disease and you're able to turn them around. Don't change what you're doing. I mean, I, I go to work with two principles every day, which is uh, I use the phrase, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Meaning if my patients are doing well, they're improving, they're having a trend, I do not do anything different. But if what I'm working, what, if what I'm doing is not working, I change what I'm doing. And so if I find a patient's not responding, I think you should avail yourself of those other options that work on other uh, pathophysiologic mechanisms. Because uh, some of these patients, especially later on, especially when I see someone coming into my ICU, they're almost always undertreated in, in advanced disease. And so I really have to throw a lot at them. And I don't know if the questioner uh, works in an ICU, but uh, it, it gets real different when you're that late phase disease. It's, it's, it can be quite hard to turn people around. Got it. Thank you very much. Chris Williams has a question. And Dr. Carvalho, if you could, uh, or Dr. Chesler, anybody who can join in. The question is, would you recommend the combination of calcifediol, vitamin D, with ivermectin for treatment? So is there any combination that is specifically important to give with ivermectin or ivermectin on its own? is Well, I, I, ivermectin has been used uh, alone, uh, which I think is uh, is um, it's not correct because it's uh, I, I'm against anything that may be considered um, a silver bullet, you know, because silver bullets have proved to be good only for the werewolves, as far as I know, mm? and uh, pretending to solve a situation with a silver bullet is too risky. So I think combinations that we have done with corticosteroids, as Pierre said, from early April last year, uh, with um, aspirin and so on, is, is the right way to deal with this kind of uh, situation we are living now. And the combination with vitamin D has also been published. And I guess it, it, it also works. It's, it's good. It's, it's reasonable. Uh, the, the only thing which is not reasonable uh, is to do nothing, to stay at home in our comfort zone uh, with the, with the uh, complicity of uh, the sanitary uh, authorities that say that nothing can be done, nothing can be done, just paracetamol and remain home and God bless you. And, that's, that's the worst thing a doctor can do, to do nothing for his patients. That's criminal. We have, yeah. we, we, we have given an oath not to do that, just to, to make our best effort, not to remain at home and do nothing. So which is the best way to use it? The way that it works for your patients. 
I and I agree with everything uh, that Hector said. Uh, he and I are of the same mind. We're both, uh, yeah. The, the one thing I want to add is calcifidiol is on our protocol, right? So we we actually recommend, uh, especially in Math Plus, um, you know, you have to use that the more um, the the closer to active forms, uh, especially late in disease. Um, regular vitamin D, like uh, cholecalciferol, doesn't seem to work once you're acutely ill. Um, totally but makes yeah, sense. We do the combo. So next question, thank you very much for this one. Next question is more on the dosing side. And I know that Dr. Cody, you talked about it a little bit. So Roberta says, we, all, we always use ivermectin 0 0.3 milligram per kilogram dose, three days associated corticosteroids in our ICU, 18% um, lethality. We have to remember that lymphopenia is a major mortality risk at a call score to COVID. So, uh, what dose in ICU patients? For steroids or for uh, ivermectin. ivermectin? So we are, we are going to 0.4 now. Uh, we have the range 0.4 to 0.6. Um, you know, we have colleagues in Zimbabwe who had just a lot of success, no problems with the 0.6. Uh, when they had their huge uh, wave, they say that on the ground now in Zimbabwe, which interestingly did not have the mass vaccination that happened in Israel. In fact, they've had like no vaccinations, but they have like zero cases and zero deaths right now. Um, it's very quiet on the ground. And they they used a lot of ivermectin. They were using 0 0.6, but I, I would use 0 0.4 and we go out to five days. Again, you got to follow your patients. I don't really like in sick patients to have a predetermined duration um, you need to follow the day-to-day -day, uh, responses of your patients. Um, if they're not improving, you go higher doses. If they've gotten better, you can decrease or stop. But um, yeah, I, I, I wouldn't do a predetermined two to three days unless, unless the questioner really has great, great responses and they're heading out of the ICU after three days. Maybe they're right. Totally makes sense. And, and my own... Oh, uh... the steroids. Did I mention the steroids? Uh, oh, I, I don't know if the question is on steroids, but for the steroids, if you look at our Math Plus... In the hospital, uh, we, we say 80 milligrams of methylprednisolone as the starting dose, period. Uh, you should get 40 milligrams IV BID, and that's what we start in a hospitalized patients. Once you're in the ICU and you advance pulmonary phase, we recommend pulse doses, and we have on there 125 to 250 Q6. We actually clinically are getting really good responses from one gram daily. You know, the classic, you know, severe autoimmune protocols. We actually are seeing even better responses by just doing one gram a day. Um, and we do that for three days. And so that's our pulse nowadays. And uh, so it's three days, but we've seen remarkable turnarounds with that strategy. Excellent. Thank you very much. And just a comment here for my patients, I use ivermectin till they come out of the symptoms. Their oxygen improves, they're feeling better. I don't Great. go with three days or four days, I just continue. Now, a couple of questions here, and I think I would have Dr. Laurie come in as well for this question. So Dr. Corey, first to you, I had heard a comment that WHO's uh, announcement that ivermectin is not, uh, not to be used and you had said that, hey, WHO may not be relevant in these discussions anymore. They put themselves in that state. I'm putting words in your mouth. The question yeah. is, don't you think that they have actually taken a position that has harmed some patient benefit that could have happened with the ivermectin use? And now more doctors and patients will be hesitant? Oh, I think it's, it's, it's incalculable harm. Incalculable harm. And, and I find it... Um... I, I mean, I can't believe what I'm learning about life as a physician in COVID. I mean, I'm, I am discovering things that I have to say I was very naive about before. You know, everyone would say they're corrupt. They do this. But I'm witnessing with a front row seat. I'm witnessing what I've talked to you about a little bit is, is that this is a disinformation campaign. The number of or the, the scale of the market of profitability and the number of players who would lose hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars by the recognition that ivermectin is effective in COVID it is so vast that you're seeing how this is playing out. The WHO, unfortunately, has shown itself over the last 250 years. They're not really a scientific organization. You know, their heyday of, of from the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, and the wonderful things that they accomplished for global public health, 
Those days are gone. They're a compromised organization. We have any amount of evidence to show that. And they're under the influence of, of pharmaceutical interest and particularly the vaccine lobby is what I'll call it, even from nonprofits that are trying to globally vaccinate the world and all of the vaccine industry, they really can't have ivermectin out there. It'll increase vaccine hesitancy. And so, so it, it's, it's almost unsurprising what the WHO did. In fact, my team, we all were expecting it. We were all expecting to, for them to do exactly what they did. And, and when you ask about how harmful that is, um, I, I, all I can say is, is, and I believe there will be a reckoning. And when, when you look at this, when we look back at this time historically, the, this is going to be a massive stain on, on, the, on, the, on the record of WHO. It's, it's going to further uh, put their reputation into, into the garbage, really. It's, it's terrible. Totally agreed. Thank you very much. Um, I want to bring in Dr. Laurie as well. There is a question, Dr. Laurie, uh, from Alejandro Bimbo FDS. They are saying, how many RCTs and meta-analysis does WHO or FDA or EMA, uh, EMA, European Medical Agency, need to approve ivermectin for COVID? So the question is, Dr. Laurie, you have been and your team have been, the world team has been very much into the data, analyzing, understanding. What is it that WHO or other organizations need, other than we know that there are interests they have? Yeah, well, it seems like their decision, you know, what they're waiting for is a large randomized trial uh, conducted by uh, 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 interests that, um, you know, that, that, that they can control and feel are valid. Um, and, I, and I believe that this is the TOGETHER trial, which is um, funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So I, I think they're waiting for this large trial. Uh, and they've been putting off everything until that. And this trial has been undertaken very rapidly. And none of us who have been working with the data believe that it's going to show anything in favor of ivermectin because, again, it's the same conflicts of interest that are that are um, involved in in the conduct of the trial. So um, the the uh, what the th the thing of note with regard to ivermectin though is that um, for its original approval for use in strong alloides, there was much less evidence. There was, there was something like mm, six or seven trials um, that got it approved for ivermectin and, and 1,500 patients or something. So the body of evidence we have on ivermectin for COVID is much greater than, than there was for its original approval uh, in strong alloides and also in its approval for scabies. So the, the approval for scabies, which is, a, these are diseases of much lower, um, uh, uh, morbidity, um, you know, re relied on six trials and around 700 people. And it actually showed that ivermectin wasn't actually as good as permethrin, but, uh, you know, but it was, they looked at other evidence, it was very safe, it was widely used, uh, widely available, and, and so they approved it for use in, against scabies. So the evidence that, that uh, underpins its use for, for um, parasites is much less than the evidence we have for its use in COVID. Got it. So thank you very much. And we are uh, under time pressure as well. So Dr. Carvalho, let's hear you quickly and then we will move forward. Yes. No, no, just, just, just a last remark from a person with, with an injury in his front uh, brain. <laughs> um, the more expensive the compound is, the less amount of uh, evidence it will be required. That's it. Right. Thank yep. you. Thank you very much. So Dr. Corey, once again, thank you very much for coming on. Thank you very much for the insights and answering those questions. There is one more question addressed to me uh, by Scarlett Monohan, M Monahan, and they are a cool bean as well. So Dr. Bean, your prophylaxis recommendation is 0.15 uh, milligram per kilogram. Would you recommend changing it to 0.2? So yes, in the given uh, variant situation, yes. And that is where I would stop the current uh, set of discussions. Let us take a five minutes break and then we resume our activity with the next uh, speakers. Thank you all very much. We'll see you in five minutes. So our great round of uh, rock stars continue. We now have Dr. Wasif Khan from Bangladesh. He's going to discuss the experience with ivermectin in Bangladesh. Just a quick reminder that number one, if you have any questions, please put them in the Q&A 
chat instead of the normal chat. That is where we can actually pick those questions easily. Number two, uh, Bangladesh, after the Kelly study from Australia about ivermectin, Bangladesh was actually one of the first countries that started using um, ivermectin. Dr. Alam over there was the first who started doing some of these researches. And we'll hear from Dr. Wasif Khan as well more. So Dr. Wasif Khan, please take it away. Welcome. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mubin, for giving me the floor. First, I like, uh, can you hear me clearly? Absolutely. Okay. So first, I'd like to thank uh, the organizers uh, for organizing this very, uh, very, very interesting for the last year that I'm hearing this international conference on ivermectin for COVID and for me as a speaker uh, and to share uh, some uh, experience from Bangladesh. Next slide, please. Uh, so my presentation will be basically a uh, two part. First, I will share the uh, randomized clinical trial that we conducted in mild COVID patient, hospitalized patient. And after there's some experience of ivermectin that's at present that's, that's been going on. So to start with actually, just to give you some background that it was in March of, uh, 8th March of 2020 that the first case of COVID was reported from Bangladesh. By that time already there has been a huge uh, news that we have been uh, hearing from CNN and BBC in US and, Af and especially in Europe, Italy, Spain, a lot of cases and lockdown has started. So as soon the first, uh, within two weeks, the Bangladesh government planned to go for a lockdown from 30th of March for two months. And we from my institution at ICDDRB and with the local pharmaceutical, we met soon after the first, within the one, first week of first reported cases that we really need to do something for this country as you know, the containment strategies and patient management varies from country to country and it depends on the resource availability. So we have limited resource, so what can we do? So apart from what WHO has been recommended for social distancing and hand wash and mask wearing, so what else we can do? So for that consideration, actually, we thought that we should go for looking for the therapeutic trial and we should look for a clinical trial of a drug that is easily available in, uh, uh, and locally manufactured is an effective, good safety profile and low cost. And by that time, already Kelly's paper was on the ground, Melbourne. So we thought that ivermectin should be one of the choice that we should be doing. And it's already been FDA approved. And we, at that time, actually, we decided that single dose is not really going to work against this. We have to, because of its short half-life and also some animal studies, we have found that to get a high concentration in, in the pulmonary tissue, it needs a higher dose for a longer period than in animal studies has shown a threefold higher. So considering all these points, we decided that we'll go for a five day course. Can I have the next slide, please? So <clears throat> the study objective was, uh, actually um, uh, it uh, was primary the days required for remission of fever, cough, and sore throat, and the virus clearance, viral clearance timing. And the secondary objective includes a requirement of oxygen, patient failing to maintain uh, peripheral oxygen saturation more than 93 despite oxygenation, number of days on oxygen support, total hospitalization, and all cause mortality. Next slide. So the study design was we recruited patients from uh, 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 public hospitals because you know that more than 80, 90 percent of the patients uh, do attend the public hospitals. So from the patient trials, patients were recruited, uh, informed consents were obtained, and eligibility criteria were assessed. Nasopharyngeal swabs for SARS-CoV-2 were looked for that, and blood assessment, routine blood, the liver, kidney, and uh, CBCs were checked. And if they fulfill the criteria. Then they were enrolled uh, and randomized. Uh, and during that, they were uh, hospitalized there. And the, the study drug, uh, they were administered. The, the vital signs were taken every 12 hour leave. Blood markers were checked. And at least the patients were kept for eight days before they had been discharged. Even if they're, and, and afterward, it was totally after eight days, it was patients, uh, a physician's discussion when to discharge them. There was a follow up at day 14 and at day, six weeks after there was a telephonic follow-up. Next slide, please. <laughs> so we had three treatment arms, uh, group A, uh, 12 milligram ivermectin single dose, 
uh, with 200 milligram stat dose of doxycycline on day one, followed by 100 milligram of doxycycline 12 hourly for four days. As Dr. Mubin said that already by that time, actually, Dr. Tariq Alam, he did some observation study in his hospital. So already there has been some interest on ivermectin and doxycycline. So doxycycline was considered in our trial also. And the, the, the interest for us was that to look for a five-day longer course of ivermectin, that is the group B. We gave 12 milligram uh, ivermectin once daily for five days. All these were given after taking food and a placebo. So it was a double-blind placebo control. So there were three drugs. So it was uh, exactly, it was made like a similar shape size. So there was, there's no way that any patient of uh, the physicians, nurses, or the patient could know uh, patient are in which group. So next slide, please. <clears throat> so the standard care was as per the national uh, uh, guideline of the clinical management uh, of coronavirus that we had at that time, this version five. As we know, the standard thing was paracetamol, antihistamine, antitussive, oxygen therapy, and these were all been given. And that's, that was the practice that uh, was going on at that time. So that was the placebo group received this, this treatment in addition to the drugs, placebos. Next one. So inclusion criteria were uh, 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 age between 18 to 65 years of either sex and on enrollment, they have to have at least one of the following sign of symptom, temperature 37.5 degree or above, cough or sore throat, uh, peripheral oxygen saturation at least 94%, duration of illness not more than seven days, no oxygen uh, support at the time of enrollment, capable to swallow oral medication, PCR where positive SARS-CoV-2 virus and informed consent was, were obtained. Just to remind you that this was the early phase when we started that trial. So obviously the patient who were, anyone was positive, they were uh, kept in institution, in institutional management were done, especially in the hospitals. So it was possible that mild cases we could enroll and kept in the hospital. Next slide, please. So the exclusion criteria, primarily any allergy or potent drug-drug interaction, if we knew about ivermectin, they were not included. Any chronic uh, illness like heart, liver, or kidney were excluded. Pregnant or lactating mothers were not taken into the study. And any patient who were enrolled in any clinical trial in the past four weeks or have received ivermectin or dioxide in the past seven days were not included in the trial. Uh, this is just a flow chart to, to show the whole study procedure, just to give you a glimpse that after the screening in different days, from day one to day 13, uh, what are the different activities that we did over the patients. And then uh, at day 14, there was another follow-up. And day six, uh, day six weeks after the study, there was a telephonic follow-up, just to give you an overall, the different activities that we conduct in different days. Next slide. So uh, next slide, please. Uh, so uh, uh, the, this is the recruitment, total recruitment. You can see that total 113 patients were assessed for eligible. Of them, 41 were excluded for different reasons. Mostly it was uh, COVID ne negative, I mean, SARS-CoV-2 negative in 30 cases and others had some other issues like liver, liver uh, high G G6PD or creatine level and one didn't give the consent. So ultimately there were 72 patients who were enrolled, which were equally divided in the three treatment arms, 24 in each group. But during the hospitalization, there were uh, four patients actually who withdraw their consent of them, two were in the five-day ivermectin and one each in the ivermectin doxy and placebo group. So in total, there were 68 patients who were evaluated of them, 22 were in the five-day ivermectin and 23 each in the ivermectin, doxycycline, and in the placebo, there were also 23 patients. Next slide. So this table basically shows the baseline demographic and vital sign of initial 72 patients that we enrolled. So you can see the different characteristics. The age, median age was around 40, 43 to 40, 45 years of age. Female were a little bit higher than male, more or less similar. And these are the house where other, we can see the vital signs were all comparable between the three treatment hours. There were no statistical difference. The pulse oximeter on admission was on and average more than 95% uh, in all the three treatment arms. Next slide. 
uh, when we look the baseline uh, clinical uh, history among the patient, the most common sign symptoms that are associated with COVID are shown on the left, fever, cough, sore throat, shortness of breath, dizziness, loss of smell and fatigue. These were all comparable and there was no overall statistical difference, although we can see that uh, there was uh, only in the dizziness and uh, loss of smell, there was relatively more patient we found in the ivermectin group compared to the other. We also looked some other variables, like as you can see in the footnote, uh, body ache, BMI, joint pain, headache, nausea, loss of taste, and these were also comparable between the three treatment arms. Next one. <laughs> Now, when we look at the comorbidity, since these were mostly young cases, as you see, the median age was 45 years. Uh, there was not much, much comorbidity were there. There were 40, uh, 32 patients who had out of 72, there's 42% had comorbidities, which were again comparable between the three treatment arms. And the, among the comorbidities, the most common was 53% was diabetes, 41% hypertension, and 25% bronchial asthma. So there was no difference in core morbidities among the three treatment arms. Next one. Now the findings. So this uh, Captain Mind estimate of clinical symptoms here, actually I have uh, merged fever, cough, and sore throat all together. And as you can see, proportion of recovery in y-axis over the seven days period. So the rate of recovery was almost similar among the three treatment arms log rent test was not statistically different. From day five onwards, as you can see, the green shaded line, which is 5-day ivermectin, uh, shows a little bit better response compared to the other two. But obviously, since uh, the numbers were very small, uh, we didn't get any statistical difference, but uh, it was comparable. The clinical responses were comparable. However, uh, next slide, please. Uh, when we compare the same, yeah, next one, please, next one. Uh, when we say, when we look into the capital mine on the SARS-CoV-2 clearance rate, it clearly shows uh, a significant difference. So basically, first I would like to say that PCR were done on admission day three, day seven, and day 14, not in every day. And what we found that clearly patients who were in the five-day ivermectin from the day three onward, they were showing a, a, a earlier clearance rate. As you can see by day, day seven, almost 50% and virus clearance 11 were cleared out of 22. And by day 14, it was almost 75% who were cleared compared to it was about 50% in ivermectin, doxycycline, and it was about 33% with placebo group. So that was clearly that virus clearance, as we have heard from the first presentation today, also from Israel, Professor Ilya has said the similar thing, which, which we also found that virus clearance was much faster with 5D ivermectin. It was statistically significant log rent text you can see. And also when you compare with ivermectin doxy with placebo, it shows significant difference. Uh, ivermectin with uh, placebo with ivermectin. Next one. Uh, we also did the Cox proportion hazard regression comparison of SARS-CoV-2 virus clearance on day 3, 7, 14 among the treatment arms. Here uh, we compared the ivermectin five day with placebo and you can see on day seven and day 14, the hazard ratio or four times and three times farther, uh, faster, clear, uh, higher with ivermectin five day compared to the placebo, uh, the times higher in the virus clearance, and which is also statistically different. As you can see, the red highlights in the extreme right column uh, when we compare ivermectin with placebo uh, on day seven and day 14. Next slide. Uh, we actually also measure, like uh, Professor Eli, the viral load count, CT value, as he has clearly mentioned, the CT is nucleic acid saturation threshold among the three treatment arms. So on baseline, is, it was comparable, as you can see, the numbers are there. By day seven, the, as the viral load coming down, the CT value went up. And in day, uh, by, by the, the, the patient who were with 5 day ivermectin has significantly higher CT value compared to the placebo group, which was statistically significant. Similarly, on day 14 also, we got the similar trend. So, so, uh, so and as you know, the, the, the lower the viral load, uh, the CT value goes up and with the CT value low means that we have the, you have the higher viral load count. So it is clearly shown that 5 day ivermectin shows the earlier clearance as well as the viral load also reduces, which is very important for public health point of view. Next slide. We also did some uh, few biomarkers actually in this study, blood biomarkers comparing before and after the treatment between the 
groups. So if we see the first group within the five-day ivermectin, the C-reactive protein, uh, compared to the day one, uh, which was 2.2 uh, milligram per deciliter, is dropped by day seven to 0 0.3, which was statistically significant. Lactic dehydrogenase also from 313 unit per liter, it dropped to 264, also statistical difference. Sim but however, when we compare with the ivermectin and doxycycline between their day one and day seven, there was no statistical difference. Uh, in the placebo incident, uh, interestingly, we got it a uh, uh, difference. It was uh, uh, within the lactose and hydrogen has dropped. We also looked at procalcitonin. There was no difference. And ferritin also, it started dropping. And we can see it's close to significant. It was not as significant, but it was very close in the ivermectin. That from 268 nanogram per ml, it dropped to 211. So clearly, the biomarkers also showed. But as I said, that since the numbers were very small, we really, really couldn't show a big difference. But there's a clearly trend it shows here. Next slide. So in summary, we can say the median duration of SARS-CoV-2 clearance was significantly higher in five-day ivermectin arm compared to the placebo. It was uh, eight, 10 days versus 13 days. In ivermectin and doxycycline arm, it was 12 days. The blood biomarkers, which interpret the disease severity of the infection, CRP and LDA, significantly dropped. Uh, and ferritin was near to significant after five-day ivermectin treatment by day seven. And the viral uh, nucleic acid cycle threshold value indicator of viral load significantly increased by five-day ivermectin compared to the placebo on day seven and on day 14. So it, uh, it clearly shows that there are benefits. And I didn't mention anything with the side effect. There wasn't any, any, any major side effect that we have come across. There were some mild cases of itching, rash, nausea, vomiting that happened. And it was also comparable between the three treatment arms. And actually, it, was, it came out in the International Journal of Infectious Disease in November 2020. Next slide, please. <laughs> So uh, now I would like to touch a little bit about the present experience of ivermectin. Can you just click there? There will be some animation. So one after another, just just hold at this point. Yeah. So first of all, our country Bangladesh is a small, uh, tiny country. As you can see in the bottom, is 150,000 square kilometer size, which is I I, I I I it has been said that the size of Wisconsin state of USA, but population wise, it is. Uh, it's not 163, it's over 170 million now, which is almost uh, almost half of, of USA. You can see so such a small country with a highly densely populated country and it's surrounded by India in three sides and in the south is Bay of Bengal. And on this right side, I've tried to put a graph where I have picked the 10 most populous, uh, populated countries which have a population of more than 100. And also on the y-axis and the population density with square kilometer. And you can clearly see the Bangladesh way above than any other country. And thus, a country like this, where uh, just public health measures, what WHO is recommend is really not possible. And we really have to do something more than that uh, of doing. And probably that is why we, we have come here today to talk about ivermectin, which could be a good thing because uh, as I, I go to the next slide, it will be more compelling to say why I will make this so important. The next slide, please. So this is just to give you an idea of Bangladesh, the COVID situation. We, as I said earlier, that first case reported on March 8th of 2020, we had the peak in June, July, August of 2020, and there is, came down almost below 5%. Uh, it was just a few hundred cases in January, February, March. But again, from end of March and April, it has shooted up now. And right now, uh, what we have been, uh, from my institution, it's been reported that the South African variants, it's almost 81%. They got it. In, uh, that is now mostly prevailing in here. The death rate has also gone up. Today also we had, uh, for the first time in this month, actually we had more than 100 deaths occurring in the consecutive four or five days now. In between, there was two days where I had little less than 100, but again, today it's again over, above 100. So severe cases are really going up nowadays. On the right is just showing the positive detection rate, and it's a similar. It was 20 to 25 percent in the first peak, and again, it's going up. And right now, we are having a lockdown for the last two weeks. But in the real sense, it's not a real lockdown. It's a semi-lockdown. semi, I would say, a semi -lockdown. There's Some shops are open. The businesses are going on. 
and people seems to be less scared compared to the last year because they don't know what to do and what. But even a lot of people are not really wearing masks that I would definitely. The next slide, please. <laughs> yeah, well, this is, a, this is a slide that I just wanted to share, share about, share that I would like to sell in Bangladesh. Uh, these are top eight pharmaceutical companies. You can see the list of the name and the brand name. Uh, here, actually, uh, this data uh, in Bangladesh is one of the hub for generic drug production. Uh, there are 257 licensed pharmaceutical companies. Of them, 150 are functional. From IMS, what we got the information, yeah, I've compared in this table, the total sale of ivermectin of 2020 compared to the 2019. You can clearly see that the sale of ivermectin has tremendously gone high in 2020 compared to the 2019. And interestingly, if you see there were one, three, five, six companies who never had any product of ivermectin in 2019. But here, uh, the top one, which uh, which is Beximco Pharmaceutical, they have over a, a million dollar sell of ivermectin, whereas they did have this product in the market in 2019. So it's clearly that can give you an idea that how much uh, uh, use of ivermectin is going on in, in the community. And especially with Dr. Tarek Alam's initial observation and followed by this paper that came out from ICDDRB. Next slide. So this is actually basically, uh, this slide is showing, this shows the, the uh, already a number of local pharmaceuticals have made brochures of ivermectin using against, uh, uh, to you use ivermectin against COVID-19 as an off-level use, which is permissible by the local regulator. Although the regulator has not yet approved ivermectin as the indicator for COVID-19, but its rampant use is going on in the country. And you can see the brochures are already been out. So I just want to touch here that here in Bangladesh, actually uh, the situation of the vaccine is that uh, from 7th of February, 2021, uh, the COVID shield vaccine from Oxford AstraZeneca produced by the Serum Institute of India has been started. But as you know, now that uh, with the sudden upsurge of COVID-19 in India, they have temporarily stopped exporting vaccines. So that has been a big blow. The government is really con concerned. So far, 5.7 million first dose of vaccines have been given in Bangladesh, which is just a peanut, 3% of the total population. And we are not sure about when the next vaccines will be coming because the existing vaccines, we are hearing that within the next 12 days is going to be exhausted. So with this thing, I think under this, precarious situation, I think the role of ivermectin as prophylactic, as we have heard earlier uh, from the other speakers and also for treatment at early stage can play an important role for Bangladesh. With that, I'd like to end my presentation. Thank you. Dr. Wasifan, thank you so much for such a wonderful, such a rich presentation, lots of data. And once again, Bangladesh has been the trailblazer. We are in the, for example, in the countries like US, we are sitting here and actually seeing how Bangladesh has been groundbreaking. So thank you very much for your work here. Uh, a couple of questions that okay. we have been receiving. So one question is, uh, it is from Laura. She's saying, Dr. Khan, do we give ivermectin to patients with BCG or cholera vaccine? Can you explain the concern, if there is any concern? Uh, well, as uh, Dr. Corey has uh, uh, earlier has mentioned that, uh, uh, Pierre Corey, that there are kind of contraindication, but uh, I haven't come across or Dr. Tarek Alam hasn't said anything because a cholera vaccine is not that commonly been used in Bangladesh. So it's not been available, but uh, I don't know if somebody else can make this uh, recommendation or what. Uh, Got I, it. So, yeah. um, Laura, I, I don't think that there is a big concern. If there is a specific reason for the concern, can you please put that and we can then see if we can comment on it. Uh, okay. Dr. Dr. Khan, next question. Uh, this is from Dr. Nijon Ekles. I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Why do you think there was less viral clearance in the ivermectin plus doxycycline group compared to ivermectin alone? Uh, well, as I said in my background, that probably the higher dose would have been much more better in clearance than uh, the virus pro and in, in the single dose may not be good enough. It may, may not be enough to clear the virus. So probably that Got would it. be the Got it. One more question. This is from German Patron. Dr. Khan, do you have any experience to 
do you have any experience to use ivermectin until respiratory symptoms decrease more than five days in older than 64 year old or with specific oxy uh, oxygen saturation lesser than 94 percent i guess the question is can we use it beyond five days i think yeah uh, beyond five days there are some papers have come out that they have been giving uh, for a longer period but since we did the study for five days, obviously, uh, you, you are, of course, uh, totally right. makes sense. And, and just German, my personal experience is not a study. I continue to work with my patients when I start ivermectin. I go on until their oxygen levels improve or their condition, clinical sim signs and symptoms improve. I do not leave it. What I have observed is if you leave it in a few days, patients, mm -hmm. sometimes they bounce back. So uh, this is just an observation from, from my own patients. Dr. Khan, uh, continuing with the questions, well, a couple of more questions here. Uh, one question is, what is the situation now for ivermectin usage? So you, sh you showed some of the pharmaceuticals that they have ivermectins available. Are doctors using them? Are you using them? Do you feel any pressure that WHO said that, hey, don't use ivermectin? What is the general trend? Yeah, well, in, I, I'm talking from the Bangladesh point of view. Yeah, it has been used in many institution hospitals. They are using it as a practice based, especially when the paper came out in a peer-reviewed journal. I know many private hospitals uh, are giving this drug. But as I said, the regulators are basically, uh, our regulators are mostly dependent on, you know, WHO and FDA. Unless they don't approve on indication, they just they keep quiet. But people are using Got it. Thank you very much. And one last question. Uh, this is from Nasiba Kathrada. Bangladesh has been using ivermectin for a while, but they still have such a huge increase in the case number. Is this because ivermectin is not used as prophylaxis? Yes, that's true because this is not, as I said, that this has not been recommended. Only some few physicians, they are doing like I know Dr. Alam is using and few others, but not in a, so that is why what I've been hearing yesterday or today that if something that bird can take an initiative and I can help our regulators with them to talk the lawyers, there are some lawyers who really work for the, for, for, for these sort of issues that can come up and they can take it to the higher authority to consider using ivermectin, especially when we don't have the option of vaccines coming very soon. And I, I also mentioned about the crowded, uh, the concentrated population in this country. Got it. So once again, uh, Dr. Khan, thank you so much for your presentation, for taking the questions, for your time. And we are now, uh, audience, we're going to move to our next presenter, next speaker. Please, once again, uh, write your questions in the Q&A chat. It is easier to get the questions from there. So let me share my screen and show our next presenter's bio. Um, he has been so active with ivermectin. So Dr. Hector Carvalho from Argentina. So Dr. Hector, I, I have discussed your bio before as well. What a wonderful uh, body of work you have. So welcome and let us start. Uh, so Dr. Hector will be talking about COVID and long haul. April 2020 and the results were duly submitted on July 2020 in which we uh, explained what we have done either for prophylaxis in uh, COVID-19. And these are the 12 peer-reviewed articles, uh, which I include here, just in case you are interested of looking for them and taking a look at them. But relax, I'm not going to talk about each of them. Uh, Dr. Laurie requested me to talk just about one of them, which I'm going to do uh, later on. As I said, we worked with ivermectin either for treatment or prophylaxis, or if you prefer, for pre-exposure and treatment. In the case of the treatment, our protocol was called IDEA because of the acronym of ivermectin, aspirin, which are used together in the mild cases, and dexamethasone and enoxaparin, which are added in the more severe cases. Uh, uh, right here, you may say, hey, wait a minute. Everybody knows that dexamethasone works for uh, COVID. I give you that. 
but we started using them on our patients on early March 2020, and their recovery trial was released two months later. So everybody is wise with yesterday's paper, but we started using it long before recovery trial. And the prophylaxis that we uh, had two different protocols, one with ivermectin alone, which was called Iberprev, and the other one uh, with the addition of carrageenan, hmm? which is, was, was called Ivercar. Uh, I'm sure that uh, the ivermectin mechanism of actions are, are going to be mentioned uh, repeatedly during the conference, so I won't stop in this. But I have to explain what are the carrageenan mechanism of action. First of all, carrageenan is a compound which is used to thicken any product, on, uh, from gastronomic products to medical products. But uh, some about five years ago, it was discovered that carrageenan had a virucidal effect by itself. And the mechanism of action against virus is either direct or indirect. The direct effect is because of opposite electric cargos. In the case of the COVID-19, uh, carrageenan has negative cargos and the virus had positive cargos. So one attached or an adhere to each other like a magnet on the door of a fridge. And such an wrapped uh, virus loses its uh, capacity to infect the cell. And the indirect effects are because of the competition for receptors. This is something that we are going to see repeatedly during the conference. It's a, a meta-analysis that has been done over 50 trials with almost 400 scientists working on them and about uh, more than uh, 15,000 patients. And all of them have proved to be positive. They have all had positive outcomes. But as you may see here, early treatment has more uh, percentage of a, a improvement than late treatment, which is a dogma of medicine. Any, any disease which is treated later will have less chances to get better. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the earlier treatments are far preferable. And this other one shows how ivermectin has been uh, added to the treatment of um, COVID-19 in about one third of the world, from Alaska to Ushuaia, Argentina. And you may, you may say, is this official? No, because unfortunately, we couldn't count on official authorizations. Some of these countries, which are in light green or dark green, have authorized them officially, but in some others, the, the use is unofficial because people keep dying out there and they need something and something that works. So mostly all, all South America, all Central America, in North America, including Alaska, I believe in Canada it's been used too, but in a lower uh, number. In Europe, two countries have authorized it uh, officially, which are the Czech Republic and Slovakia. Also Macedonia has authorized it, but Macedonia is not a part of the European Union. Uh, in Africa, uh, this, uh, this continent should be in green, all the continent, because all the continent uses ivermectin. But the countries which are not marked here have been using ivermectin for decades in order to treat uh, river blindness, that is onchocerciasis. That is why they are not included, because they simply don't have COVID. The countries like Egypt or South Africa that added uh, ivermectin uh, for the treatment of COVID later on, they are included. Also in India, with millions of uh, patients treated in the Middle East, Japan, and so on and counting. 
And now, as uh, I previously mentioned, we want to say a few words about long COVID patients. We have, treat, we have used ivermectin for pre-exposure, exposure, early treatment, late treatment, and even after uh, dismissal from the hospital for those patients that hadn't used it before. And uh, this is a, a, a peer-reviewed article called Ivermectin in Low COVID Patients Retrospective Study. It was performed by both myself, Dr. Hirsch, and Dr. Aroldo Del Franco in a public hospital in the province of Buenos Aires. Uh, this follow-up was conducted on 856 patients discharged from hospitalization at, the, at that hospital uh, from July 2020 till now. And those patients had not received ivermectin either before or during hospitalization. So they were, so to say, virgin of ivermectin. They had received corticosteroids, antibiotics, blood thinners, convalescent plasma, whatever, but not ivermectin, because the truth is that if they had received ivermectin, they wouldn't have become long howlers, and that's a fact. Um, from these 856 patients, almost 800 were included for ambulatory control with ivermectin in post-COVID, but 57 were not because they had they developed paranoid disorder, disorders after this missile, so they had to be referred to psychiatrist uh, facilities, memory loss that were um, suggestive of dementia, so they had to be sent to the neurologist, dysgeusia, mainly uh, mixing salad and sweet sensations, but due to other otolaryngology issues, so they had to be sent to otolaryngology um, um, service. Fatigue, hmm? but uh, it happened to be caused by anemia and or oncologic issues that had not been previously diagnosed. So they had to be referred either to hematology or oncology. Hmm? These patients, all these patients, 57 patients that were not included in the study had been at the intensive care unit for over 10 days. The other group, the, the 799, uh, they had noted that after dismissal from the hospital, the symptoms kept um, present, and were still present. And those symptoms were coughing, but not related to previous history of cold, brain fog, not related to any other neurological cause, headaches, persistent fatigue, loss of taste or smell, shortness of breath, and body and joint aches with no related uh, history of arthritis. All these patients, almost 800 patients, received ivermectin ranging from 12 to 18 milligrams per mouth, on a weekly basis, you know, uh, up till now, you know, we are the weekly basis guys, mm -hmm. uh, until the symptoms disappeared, but no longer than eight weeks, what happened first. Some of them also received polyvitamin compounds, but they did then that uh, an auto prescription, and there were no more than 12 patients, so, we didn't take them out of the cohort that was studied. The average time needed to get rid of uh, the symptoms mentioned before were 33 days, ranging from 21 to 69 days. The side effects reported by Avermectin were diarrhea episodes in five patients and abdominal pain in two patients. No cases of allergy were reported. And as long as there were no pregnant or lactating women among this group, we didn't have to take into account the possibility of discharging these subjects from the study. 
The conclusions of the essay is uh, that this. Long COVID includes a constellation of symptoms that may be caused by an obtrusive persistence of virus in different tissues and the subsequent persistence of inflammatory and coagulation disorders. Since ivermectin has already proved to impair virus capacity to invade cells and also to have immune and clotting modulatory effects, which are, in my opinion, the most important, there is a reasonable chance to diminish, shorten, and even completely correct almost all the symptoms by using ivermectin in the post-COVID if it had not been used before, because if it had, there wouldn't be long COVID patients. And the general conclusions are this. During this year and a half of a pandemic, we have had to face, to face two powerful enemies. One of them is merciless, relentless, tireless, lethal, polyphacetic. The other one is just a virus. So we have to behave like kites. The stronger the wind against us, the higher we must fly because the consequence of that flight is the life of our patients. Thank you so much. And I'm open to eventual questions. Dr. Carvalho, thank you so much for your uh, discussion. What a wonderful discussion and important messages there as well. So I have a few questions as well, if I can uh, uh, have you back here uh, with us. I think you are on mute as well. Yep, I'm here. Excellent. So great talk. Thank you very much. So I'm going to start with some of the questions that are here. One question, what is the age range to whom ivermectin is recommended? whether as prophylaxis or treatment for COVID-19, what is the dosage and frequency of intake? Well, we have used it uh, for um, prophylaxis, that is pre-exposure, um, since uh, sec, um, 12 years of age until, well, there's no limit. Mm, there's is no, there any contraindication no, then for any age? No, uh, it, uh, actually, uh, before the pandemic, the doctors, the specialists who knew more about ivermectin were the pediatricians and the dermatologists because they used it from two years older or for 15 uh, kilograms of weight on uh, for scabies, ectoparasitosis, enteric parasitosis, and so on. But we didn't use them in that group in the pediatric group, just because it uh, it seemed not to be necessary in the first wave, because uh, children were not effective. Just a few children developed um, Kawasaki syndrome, PIMS, but most of them, most of them didn't uh, develop uh, severe symptoms. They were affected. They contracted the virus, and they. Uh, could be contagious because uh, the, the worst, the worst contagious situation is the one with a patient that doesn't know his condition. Mm. So they were asymptomatic uh, patients, but they could uh, transfer the, the virus to anybody else. Got but it. now in during the second wave, we are seeing with a concern that the new variants are uh, affecting younger stages, younger ages. Mm? The, the Brazilian variant, the Manaus variant, which is close at hand because we are neighbors with Brazil, uh, affects uh, children. So we are uh, starting using prophylaxis mm -hmm. from two, uh, from five years on. Got it. And, and quickly, two more questions on the same one. One is the uh, dose and the second one is any side effects that you would like doctors to be aware of? Well, in Argentina, um, there are more, more studies than ours 
uh, one was conducted in the province of Tucumán, and it, it was it was a very very nice uh, trial, very professional, and they standardized the doses, and uh, they found out that by standardizing the dose, uh, the the outcomes were not as good as when you attach the dose to the weight of the patient. That is when you personalize the dose. And the dose we use here is, uh, we use uh, the, the, the liquid um, product um, and we use two drops of ivermectin uh, to, to begin with for the, uh, for the treatment and one drop per kilogram I'm talking, one drop uh, for prophylaxis. When we want to change it to uh, pills, uh, we get the, the number of uh, drops we have been using, and then we uh, divide it by 30, and we have the, the quantity of pills, because our pills are, have six milligrams, instead of the American ones right. that have three, three milligrams. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you, you have to divide by 15, Dr. B. You have to divide by 15. But anyway, and talking about the dose itself, we start using uh, from uh, 0.2 micrograms per kilogram for the prophylaxis and uh, 0.4 micrograms per kilogram in the treatment. In, in the, so 0 0.2 in, milligram per kilogram to 0 0.4 milligram per kilogram. Thank you very much. Correct. Next question. So we have a tons of questions. I want to quickly go through them. Another question that is very interesting, and I think this is a, a key question. Uh, somebody has asked that if I want to convince my you know, family members that ivermectin is useful, uh, this would be a situation with the doctors as well, one doctor convincing another that it is useful, it is efficacious. What is, uh, how do we tell that? How do we convince someone? Well, first of all, I don't want to convince anybody because um, in, in my 40 years as a medical doctor, I have divided the lecturers into two wide groups. The one, uh, one group which wants to share an opinion, which wants to share an idea, and the other group who wants to sell a product. I'm not here to sell in a product. We, any of us, is now on Sunday evening uh, trying to sell a product. So it's not a matter of combining people. Um, it's easier to combine your beloved ones because they rely on you. It's easier, far easier than combining the, the authorities. But that is because they, uh, they have millions of reasons to uh, remain reluctant. Got it. Got it. Thank you. So one question from Dr. Tess Laurie, who is here. So what was the rationale just... for the weekly dosing in long COVID? Some doctors, such as Dr. Agira Chang in Peru, give two to four days initially. Well, if it works for him, it's good. I've seen so, so many different uh, doses, so many differences in, in, in the intervals. And that the only thing that you can take from all those differences is that ivermectin works because no matter how you use it, it works. Got it. And, and audience, we are trying to answer as many questions as possible. I, the, the questions are, outstanding questions are 144. So we clearly cannot reach to everyone. We are trying our best and we'll continue to do follow-ups as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Carvalho, one more question. It is from Edmund Fordham. The question is, what is Dr. Carvalho's view of the relative importance of ivermectin versus topical carrageenan in his prophylaxis regimen? Well, uh, topical carrageenan has proved to be very effective. Uh, we have developed uh, a trial at the, the May, 2020, we used it together with Avermectin, but some other colleagues have used it alone. And there's a new trial which has been released in Europe, in Austria, uh, that also proves the effectiveness of carrageenan to reduce the possibility of contracting the virus. Um, I think that carrageenan is a wonderful alternative for those cases in which we cannot use Avermectin. 
for prophylaxis. Got it. Okay. Such, such as pregnant women, lactating women, young children, because carrageenan is also present in mat, ma, matern, uh, maternal milk, the, the milk that is sold uh, uh, in, instead of natural milk. So if it is there for lactating children, it means that there's no problem with using uh, carrageenan in children. Got it. So one more question on carrageenan. What strength are carrageenan nasal? So I think they're trying to ask strength and the type. Is it nasal spray, uh, so, mouth? Sorry, or? sorry. Sorry, Dr. Bean, before that question, mm -hmm. I saw a question there that said, Carag there's plenty of carrageenan in Ireland. Yes, carrageenan was discovered in Ireland 500 years ago. OK, so Very the question good. was? Carrageenan strength, nasal spray. Is there a carrageenan nasal spray and a mouthwash as well? And type yes. of carrageenan. There, there are two, ty two types of carrageenan. Hmm? One for uh, the nasal, nasal spray and the uh, buccal mouth spray. Anyway, you can use the, the nasal spray both for the, the rhinopharynx and the oropharynx. Uh, it doesn't taste very good because it's too salad. But anyway, it works. Got it. Uh, we, we, nev we, we never said that it would, uh, uh, it would taste good. <laughs> Got it. It's a medicine. So uh, one more question. Luis Hernandez says, Dr. Carvalho, what is the indiv individualized dose nowadays for long haul? So what dose do you use for long haul? Uh, we are using from 12 to 18 milligrams per os. So we uh, attach to a schedule to make it easier. Got it. And one more question from Andre. He's saying, have you have any experience in using ivermectin plus nitazoxanide or fluvoxamine? Do no, you use any combinations no, like that? No, we haven't used it with uh, other antiparasitic uh, compounds and not with uh, um, the, any drug that may be used uh, uh, to reduce uh, prostate cancer. Mm? Uh, but the fact is, there's one drug that we have used that has kept disregarded by most of the scientific uh, community, which is bromexin. Bromexin is used for a simple catar, uh, to, uh, for stop coughing. Mm? And uh, bromexin has proved many years ago that is as strong as um, toxilizumab and nefasostat to uh, block the TMPRS2 uh, receptors. And uh, the fact that it wasn't used for that reason is because it's too cheap. And, and just to add a quick comment here, I've done a lot of study about the bromhexin as well. So bromhexin is a TMPRS2 blocker as uh, Dr. Carvalho just mentioned. And mm -hmm. interestingly, Ivermectin is also a TMPRSS2 or basically a protease inhibitor as well of this type. So it is an interesting uh, combination. Dr. Carvalho, one more question. Uh, Laura Chamberlain says, you did not post the result of your study. Did 100% of the long COVID patients results in the eight weeks of the study? Uh, or uh, they revolve, they become corrected or cured in the study? No, I don't quite understand the question. So is the long COVID data that you shared, is that a study, number one? And did everyone recover when you- Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, sooner or later from, uh, uh, with an average of 30, 36 days, everyone recovered. Got it. Cool. So thank you very much, uh, Dr. Carvalho, your work has been great. The studies have been great. The data has been great. I cannot imagine the amount of contribution that you have done. Uh, tell me this one last question from me. What is the situation in, in Argentina? How much is um, ivermectin used or not used? What is the political and clinical situation there? On the record, on the record, for the record, for the record, there are six provinces which has already uh, adopted ivermectin, both for prophylaxis and treatment. Mm? The, the six Argentinian provinces. Argentina is divided into provinces, as uh, the United States is divided into states. So a state is a province. And uh, the rest of the country is using it uh, off the record. 
I guess there's no more well-known compound in Argentina as far as COVID-19 is referred than ivermectin. I can tell you, though I cannot prove it, but I can tell you without lying that even the authorities are using ivermectin, even the ones that are supposed to authorize it are using it. Very interesting. So once again, tons of thank you for coming in, for your data, for your video, and for your answering those questions. Thank you so very much. You're very uh, welcome. So audience, once again, we'll continue with our discussion. Our next guest, our next rock star for today. And I think that this is a topic that is such an important topic, uh, the long COVID. There is an outbreak that is going on and I believe that this would be handled soon, it would go away. But there is another fallout of this and that is long COVID. These are the symptoms that are now living for a longer period of time. And there is very little that has been done there. So I think this is a very, very important topic that is coming up next. So Dr. Tina Pierce is next. Her background, as I've discussed before as well, uh, in the contraception and reproductive health. And now she has been very important topic, the mast cell activation uh, syndrome. And that is the area which she's going to describe and discuss with us for long, haul long hauling state. So Dr. Pierce, please take it away. Welcome. Thank you very much indeed. Well, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you today. I'm just going to try and share my screen. Um, here we are. Uh, just going to the slideshow. Here we go. Lovely. Fantastic. So first of all, thank you very much indeed for giving me this opportunity to share my work. Um, and uh, after Hector's fantastic presentation, I feel a little um, shy <laughs> and nervous, but um, I will try and follow that fantastic presentation that he did. So um, what's been happening? Treating long COVID. Uh, this is um, a topic very close to my heart. We've got 1.1 million people. Uh, patients in the UK now who have probably got long COVID and that means that there'll be many many people all across the world with this condition um, and I've been working to a hypothesis and it is a hypothesis um, that could what could be causing this so I feel that um, and some other doctors who work with muscle activation also agree with this that acute COVID could be exacerbating muscle activation in patients who have this condition pre-existing which was hitherto unrecognized and untreated. Also, acute COVID could cause mast cell activation in the minority of patients with long COVID. That is another possibility. And the third possibility is that viral persistence in some cases is continuing to elicit the immune response that is causing mast cell activation. So, what is mast cell activation? Well, this is a condition that is frequently seen in every clinic around the world, but is very seldom recognized. Um, and this is, it's thought that up to 17% of the population actually have got dysfunctional mast cells of one sort or another. And um, it was first described as a syndrome in the 1990s. And the first treatments were developed um, since 2007. So it's quite a newly described condition and therefore it's not on a lot of people's radar. It causes patterns of chronic inflammation in various different systems, with most of the tests being completely normal, uh, but it results in often debilitating symptoms. So patients present with things typically like IBS and food intolerances, chronic headaches, they can have various dermatological conditions. Um, uh, presentations such as hives, urticaria, dermatographism. Um, they can have um, fibromyalgia, they can have POTS, uh, they can present with ehlers Danlos, hypermobility, interstitial cystitis. There's all sorts of um, sin parts of the syndrome that are pr presentations of hyperinflammation. And um, these symptoms seem to be caused by cytokines and amines, which are released by the mast cells. As we know, the mast cells release over a thousand different cytokines and we don't know what 
many of them even do. Um, there's so many of them. And the, 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 um, the studies and the investigation into this condition is so immature and young that we haven't got very much information. But uh, we do know a bit about some of the chemicals that are released by the mast cells, such as histamine. And we know that histamine causes a lot of inflammation in the tissues and the histamine intolerance is a frequent feature. Now, I had started developing this hypothesis in August when I started hearing about long COVID patients. Um, and prior to that, I had been thinking that perhaps the patients who were suffering with very severe acute COVID were patients who had undiagnosed and untreated mast cell activation. And that's why they, the, they were being overwhelmed by inflammation caused by the acute virus. And that was resulting in, in, the, um, in them having, having to end up in ICU and sometimes dying. Um, but um, anyway, the International Journal of Infectious Diseases published a, a paper by Afrin, Weinstock and Maldrings on September the 10th in 2020. And these um, are, the, are the colleagues who discuss and investigate and treat patients with mast cell activation syndrome. And they said that the, their hypothesis was that the hyperinflammation seen in COVID-19 is consistent with mast cell activation syndrome. The prevalence of severe COVID-19 is similar to that of mast cell activation syndrome. Drugs inhibiting mast cells and their mediators show promise in COVID-19. And none of the patients treated in this way for acute COVID-19 have had severe forms of the disease or mortality. So their treatments were proving to be very successful. Dysfunctional mast cells and mast cell activation syndrome may underlie severe acute and chronic COVID-19 illness. So this is what these colleagues were uh, had written in their article, and it's an excellent article. I would really recommend it to everybody. Um, I have been telling patients, recommending patients who I've come across with acute COVID, which isn't very many, possibly 10, um, to also uh, take medication as if they had mast cell activation syndrome. And I must say that all of them have started to feel better within 24 hours of using this very simple, safe, over-the-counter medication. Um, oh, sorry, I have to go back. There we are. The International Ivermectin for COVID, um, the other um, paper that I'd like to draw your attention to is the paper by Cambridge University published in January, 2021. And um, this paper, they looked at um, patients who had been in hospital, uh, hospitalized from COVID, and then they followed them up with regular testing. And they said that the likelihood that severe and long COVID may be established in the early stages of the disease is highly likely. They felt that asymptomatic, this is what they found, asymptomatic or mild disease is characterized by robust immune response early on in the infection. So people who are asymptomatic or have a mild form of the disease, they have a good immune system. They have a robust um, attack of the virus initially, and then everything in their immune system resets to normal very quickly. So a good response and a good reset. Whereas the patients admitted to hospital to have an, who have an impaired immune response and um, a severe inflammation from the time of symptom on onset. So those who were admitted seem to have a different kind of immunological response to the virus. Persistent abnormalities were found in the immune cells and a change in the bodies of the immune response may contribute to long COVID. This overreaction of the immune system causes the cytokine storm and the severe inflammation that can result in organ failure and death. So basically, Cambridge University and Addenbrooke's Hospital, their research found exactly what would substantiate and, and um, um, uh, value what Dr. Afrin and Weinstock and Mulderings had, um, had in their hypothesis. So they found that there was mild or no symptoms. Patients with mild or no symptoms had a robust adaptive response producing B cells, T cells and antibody specific to the virus. And then there was a quick resolution to normal with no inflammation. Severe COVID patients, they had a delay in early adaptive response with profound, profound abnormalities in a number of white cell subtypes and evidence of severe inflammation early after onset of symptoms. This response was not initially determined by the viral load. 
Persistence of the abnormal immune cell types for weeks or months with resolution depending on the type of immune cells. And some cell populations remain abnormal or show limited recovery even after systemic inflammation has resolved. And I would think and hypothesize that these are the patients with the abnormal mast cells in the first place who don't fully recover and don't get back to normal mast cells and um, normal immune cells. So I decided, um, having thought about this and worrying about whether these patients actually did have mast cell activation, that I really needed to try and find out. So I went on to BBC News Look East, and um, this was in October, and I asked patients with long COVID to download a free app called People With and to put in their their symptom profile because I wanted to see if their symptoms looked like those of my patients with mast cell activation syndrome and lo and behold 2,000 amazing people did download their symptoms and they started recording their profiles and they were absolutely identical to those with mast cell activation. Um, so then I felt that I really wanted to talk to some of these patients and I wanted to see if I could help them. So I opened a long COVID clinic and it was opened on the 1st of November in 2020. Um, and it was fully booked within 36 hours of opening until the 31st of March, 2021, which just shows how with social media, how quickly the word gets around when there is something that might help these patients. Remember that up until now, these patients have been going to their GPs and they had been sent to various different specialists depending on their symptoms. So those who had cardiac symptoms would be sent to a cardiologist. Those who had GI symptoms, or if they did have those as well, they'd be sent to a gastroenterologist. Then they'd go to a neurologist for their headaches and their neurological symptoms. Then they might see a dermatologist for their rashes and their skin problems. And nobody was sort of looking at them holistically and pulling it together. And by the way, all of their tests predominantly were absolutely normal when they went to all of these specialists. There were only three cases in my patients who had myocarditis, um, so inflammation of the heart muscle, but everyone else's tests were all completely normal. So within a short space of time, I saw 60 patients and eight men and 52 women, so predominantly women. Um, and 58 of them, when I took their history, 58 out of the 60 had a previous medical history suggestive of M MCAS, of mast cell activation syndrome. And there were only two in whom I couldn't find any previous history at all. So this was quite interesting. Um, well, what are the typical symptoms of MCAS and therefore of long COVID? Well, these are some that you'll be very, very familiar with. So abdominal pain, diarrhea, nausea, vomiting, bloating, food intolerances, typical IBS type symptoms. Then skin symptoms include itching, sudden redness, flushing of their neck and face, uh, rashes, dermatographia, um, ex worsening of eczema, psoriasis and rosacea suddenly developing as well. Um, then cardiac symptoms, including palpitations, vertigo, arrhythmia, hypotension, POTS type sy uh, syndrome, um, Coeni's disease, which is a very interesting condition of angina without any plaques or uh, narrowing of the arteries caused by any obstructions. So this is um, frequently described in my patients with mast cell activation and some of the patients with long COVID are now describing this. Also patients could have runny nose, um, noses, sneezing attacks, asthma and shortness of breath, but often their asthma doesn't respond to typical um, inhalers uh, because it has a different mechanism. Then headaches, migraines, sweating, freezing, menstrual pains, fibromyalgia, tingling sensations, brain fog, anxiety, panic attacks, insomnia, fatigue, post-exertional malaise. This list is not exhaustive. Unfortunately, it's, uh, there are many, many more symptoms. And um, in fact, um, I think on the people with app now, 8,000 people with long COVID have downloaded the app and they are describing about 109 different symptoms that they've experienced. So it's a, a massive number of symptoms. So how, do, how have I been treating them? Well, what I've been doing is I've been treating them as for my mast cell activation patients. So I put them on a low histamine diet um, and that is because we know that their histamine levels will be high if their mast cells have been stimulated. 
And um, I have found that many, many of the patients have very poor metabolism of histamine and therefore allowing them to continue eating high histamine seems to make uh, delay their re recovery and make them much worse. So going on a low histamine diet um, is, uh, I think, very, very helpful. I then put them on type 1 antihistamines. Um, so one of the following, loratadine, cetirizine, fexfenidine, anything that we can get hold of easily. They can buy in the UK loratadine and cetirizine over the counter. So, um, and fexfenidine is also available over the counter, actually up to 120 milligram tablets. So we have to um, try each one for two or three weeks and see which one suits them best, but they have to be given in the right doses. So the loratadine and the cetirizine would be 10 milligrams three times a day, not just once a day, as we'd say on the packaging that they would buy. Um, the fexfenidine can be given up to four times a day at 180 milligrams. Then type two antihistamines, famotidine, which is the strongest one, and nizatidine. We used to have ranitidine available, but unfortunately that was taken off the market, uh, which is a great loss because it was very, very helpful. Um, and then a mast cell stabilizer, I usually give them rapatidine or ketotifen. And if they have predominantly gut symptoms, um, sodium chromoglycate can be very helpful. Then there are various um, other supplements that they can take. I like them to take a probiotic that is a low histamine one um, and uh, to get their microbiome as healthy as possible. Um, also vitamin C and D and niacin, uh, vitamin B3, and then selenium, zinc and magnesium, also very helpful. And I would love to give them all ivermectin. So I put it there at the bottom of my list. Um, I have given three patients ivermectin and they've all responded very well, but possibly we haven't persisted with it for long enough because their symptoms have returned, but not as bad as they were in the first place. So um, I think I'd be very interested in now adding ivermectin to my list, but um, giving it more consistently like, um, like Hector has. So um, this is just a, a, the last, my last slide. Um, I go, I'm actually organizing a conference, which is going to be the 19th and 20th of June. Um, and it's going to be on how can we treat long COVID. And uh, um, Hector is going to be uh, speaking at that conference uh, as well, which I'm just inviting anyone who's more, is interested in learning more about it, then please do join us. Um, Part of the workup that I do with my patients is we've been doing their genetic testing and we found that there are certain themes uh, that are very common to patients who have long COVID um, and we'll be presenting those at the conference. And also we've been doing a lot of their um, microbiome testing. And again, there are certain things that keep coming up um, as, uh, as, be, as occurring very uh, more commonly than you'd expect in the general population. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Dr. Piers. What an important topic and thank you very much for such a thorough and fascinating coverage of it. I feel that the, the worst outcome other than, so there is so much lives lost that it is unbelievable and that is tragic. And a tragedy that is now unfolding is the long haul state because this is going to make people and it is making people miserable for a longer period of time. I have heard from my patients that I just don't have any interest in living with this situation. So thank you very much for doing this work and thank you to Dr. Carvalho as well for his work. Uh, a few questions here. Actually, there are a lot of questions. I'm gonna to try to do as many as I can. So first of all, what is that app? Is that app still available? Should people still be using it and get in contact with you with that? Can you mention the app that you were offering? Yes, so the app is called People With, and that's written as one word. And it's free and it's available um, in most, many parts of the world. I'm not sure I, that I can say everywhere, but I know it's uh, available in America and Europe, most of Europe um, and the UK. Um, and it, it, people can download it. Their information is confidential on the app, but they can track 
their symptoms. They can load them on, track them. It's a lovely app actually, because it also reminds them to take their vitamins, minerals and their medication and so on. And they can sort of put in their lifestyle exercise and, and et cetera. So it's very helpful for patients. Um, right. And um, it helps them to see if they're getting better. They can also download a report and send it to their doctor to see improvement uh, because sometimes it's not easy to remember how well you were or when you had you know, exacerbations of your symptoms. Got it. And that, that is something that happens with these long COVID patients. I'm sure you found the, the same, Dr. Uh, Dr. Boot McBean, the, that um, they um, they can relapse. You know, they felt a bit better after <laughs> after a few yeah. months and then they overdo it and they go back to their exercise regime or they try to get back to completely normal life. And then they're, they're knocked sideways and they end up with all the symptoms again, uh, which can be very uh, frustrating and demoralizing for them. Absolutely. And I want to uh, add a comment here from Dr. Carvalho uh, for the doctors who are listening in. Um, adding ivermectin during the treatment or what I've seen is that in addition to ivermectin, if you feel that somebody is going to become long COVID, if they are re slowly recovering, then adding a low steroid dose therapy is also very useful and it protects the patients. Uh, Dr. Pierce, next question. What is low histamine diet? Okay, so um, it's quite restrictive. Um, it means um, no histamine blockers, that's diamine oxidase enzyme blockers. So no tea, no coffee, no alcohol, and no green tea are the first thing to say. The second thing is to, it's, um, it means excluding things like tomatoes, avocados, spinach. Um, it means not having citrus fruits, um, you, you know, it's easier to say what you can have than what you can't have, actually, because it's yeah. a much smaller list. But there's quite a lot on the Internet about low histamine diets. It's there are lots of conflicting lists, so it's a bit difficult. But there is a very good website, uh, which is the Swiss website. It's called Histamine Intolerance by the SIGI group. Um, that's the Swiss interest um, group in histamine intolerance. And they've got quite a comprehensive list of uh, foods and spices and drinks, et cetera, that you can, um, you can check your shopping list against. Um, and uh, yeah, but it's really helpful to, to exclude the high histamine foods. Got it. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. So there are some long haulers who have brain fog, myalgias, fatigue, difficulty in focusing. Mm. Uh, have you used uh, fluvoxamine or some other such drug with the other treatments? No, I haven't personally, but some of the patients already come on them when they, um, by the time they've seen me, because often they've had the condition for about a year and they've been given some antidepressants uh, because they're quite literally very depressed by that stage. And most of them have said that they found them very helpful um, so it's usually, uh, it's not something that I've instigated, but it's something that my patients often come and they're already on them Got and, it. They, and they comment that they find them helpful. Got it. And so on fluvoxamine, there is a question as well that I want to read out. And this is something I, Dr. Kori, if he was here, he would have answered it. I'm going to, at the risk of uh, representing him, which I cannot really very correctly, but I'm going to answer this question. Uh, the question is, why fluvoxamine is the new guideline? I think they're talking about um, IMAS plus. Patients in psychiatric hospitals get neuroleptives, et cetera, every kind of medication. What is the rationale in Pierre Corey's prescribing on an antidepressant? I am not happy enough with the current explanation. Thank you, I am a psychiatrist. I would like to understand better. So uh, of course, uh, if Dr. Corey is here, uh, we would have his question. We would reach out to him as well some answers that I have uh, found out. So there is a study that was done about fluvoxamine in which they used fluvoxamine not for depression, but as a, a sigma one blocker, and that would reduce the inflammation. So think about ivermectin reducing inflammation in the body and it is not crossing the blood brain barrier and going to the brain. So if you want, wanted to have a similar uh, effect in the brain, then fluvoxamine can go and uh, work with the sigma one. So that was the basic studies outcome and they had a tremendous significant result with that. I have actually discussed that um, uh, study as well. So I believe that rationale for adding fluvoxamine is that. However, uh, again, I am trying to uh, add color from my side. This may not be the reason we'll reach out to Dr. Corey as well. So continuing with the other questions, one question that is really important 
is uh, Dr. Pierce, why is MCAS? So MCAS is still a wonder for a lot of the medical community. Some folks even say that this does not exist. Some actually have, you are practicing it. I have talked about this as well. Why is it so difficult to number one, test for MCAS and manage it? It's, it's very difficult to get colleagues to um, take an interest and accept it because all the tests are usually normal. That's the first thing. Um, the tests are usually normal because the laboratories that we use commonly for our patients haven't got enough um, 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 machines with the, enough sensitivity to detect the small changes that will be needed to make the diagnosis in some of the chemicals. Now, the chemicals released by the mast cells are very potent chemicals, and they're designed to be very potent, and the body wants to get rid of them very quickly, therefore. So they're supposed to be there when you have a virus, get rid of them quickly, and then everything back to normal. Um, and so therefore, they're ever-changing levels in the body. And if you take a, a sample uh, and it's not handled properly, it's very difficult to see those chemicals in that fleeting moment. So it's incredibly difficult for us in the UK, especially to prove to, um, to, to the other doctors, look, this is, these are their abnormal results because they all just sort of come back normal. There's one lab in Bonn in Germany, in the whole of Europe, that can detect the changes in heparin level that are required to make the diagnosis. This is just not very, you know, so it's very basically a clinical diagnosis that we are making. Um, sorry, what was the other part of the question, Dr. Mabeen? So uh, this was the main question that why is it so difficult to understand it? Yeah. And then why is it so difficult to manage it? Is it just the understanding that it, it exists and that is why we don't manage it or management yeah. itself is tricky yeah. as well? The, man the management is quite tricky too. You have to be very patient and the patient has to be very patient. Um, and the, um, they, you know, often patients don't really want to change their diet uh, and their lifestyle very much. But when they do, they find the benefits um, are, are amazing. Uh, and then when they have, um, they, they have weaknesses and they give in to a glass of wine, they often pay for it, you know, and they, then they start to see the sort of method uh, and the reason for restricting these things. But um, it, it's, you have to be very patient as well because the patient's um, immune systems can become so oversensitive that they're sensitive to excipients in the medication not necessarily to the drug, but to the excipients. And therefore you have to keep trying different ones to find the one that's best for them. So it, it requires a very patient and methodical approach. Got but it. Thank you. patients respond really quickly. You know, I've had patients who've, who've got better within a week um, and, uh, and they're, 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 you know, and others by the six week checkup are 80% better, 90% um, better, you know? So it's, it's definitely worth doing. So perfect segue in my last question, and you already answered it. So Mireli Fanus had this question, Dr. Pierce, on average, how long before patients start seeing improvements on an antihistamine diet, how long would you keep them on it? So you almost touched on it. Any further expansion uh, on this? So, so uh, I mean, some patients feel, start to feel better within days. Some, it takes a bit longer. Um, some patients end up feeling better than they did pre-COVID because they had undiagnosed and untreated mast cell activation, um, which is always very gratifying. Um, and I would keep them on the, the uh, low histamine diet for probably about six months and then gradually start to, until they're stable, and then gradually start to reintroduce um, foods one at a time and, and slowly so that they, can, they don't overwhelm their system. As I said, many of these patients, we think that about 20 to 30% of the population have um, problems with their genetics in as much that they don't metabolize histamine very efficiently. And so if your body is overwhelmed with histamine, you're not going to handle it very well. Um, and staying on the low histamine diet can help to keep those levels down. But hopefully then things settle down. And uh, oh, and another, another treatment actually, I forgot to put on my protocol, is for them to have um, neuroplastic retraining of their brain. So I actually recommend that they do something like the Gupta program uh, to help retrain their amygdala and insular parts of their brain to calm down their immune system. Got it. So thank you very much. Fascinating area, important area, critical, critical area to help. And thank you very much for the help to, that you're doing. So um, audience, 
please uh, thank you very much for uh, for listening in as well for all your questions as well we are trying our best so we'll take a break for 10 minutes and then we will come back and continue with our discussions thank you so our next uh, rock star our next presenter is dr manjul madhi he's going to talk about the you know what is going on in the front line when we are uh, treating covid patients and i think the context would be with ivermectin as well so we have seen dr madhi's uh, bio before as well he has been working as a consultant in infectious diseases at fourth valley royal hospital since october 2017 so dr madhi welcome and please take it away so i'm i'm very grateful for the opportunity to speak to such a, a large and diverse audience from the frontline perspective of a infectious diseases consultant working in the in the UK NHS and I work in Scotland so it's the Scottish NHS. So this will be very much from the perspective from the UK and the NHS but hopefully it'll be applicable to everybody globally and um, after all the great talks we've had today which has just been fantastic this one will be hopefully um, not, not as clever, not as intellectual, but hopefully just an opportunity to, to talk about how to come together and how to take some actions going forward. And really I want to start with where I want to end and is that's just to thank the, the bravery and the sincerity and the humanity of, of the organizers and everyone who's attending today and, and let today be the start of an ongoing movement that, that leads to improvement in patient lives as, as soon as possible. My background is I work in a district general hospital in central Scotland and uh, I, I work on a 32 bedded ward which for a lot of the last 12 months has been filled or almost full of COVID patients and I routinely follow up all discharges with a six week telephone call monitoring on long COVID but I won't talk about that um, just now because we've had that covered very extensively but I will be hoping to do original research um, looking into treatments for long COVID in the near future. Um, this, I think, will be typical for the majority of, of people around the world. This is the very typical presentation of the patients that I see in the UK. Uh, we don't routinely do a CT chest, but we do if there is um, concern of a PE or other complications. I think in some parts of the world, CTs are done much more commonly. And we very much follow the, the treatment protocol as, as really directed by the recovery trial predominantly, which obviously is a UK based trial. And um, so the, the NHS um, has taken a lot of its lead on treatment. Um, and so the standard of care currently for severe COVID, which is the majority of patients I see in hospital with hypoxia is oxygen DVT prophylaxis low dose dexamethasone for up to 10 days and to consider tocilizumab if the CRP is greater than 75 and ongoing recruitment into the recovery trial, which is, has just stopped recruiting on aspirin. So we should get a result for that soon. And it's currently got um, biracitinib, which is a JAX1 and 2 inhibitor, the Regeneron antibody cocktail and a, a new uh, drug used for multiple scler sclerosis that's just recently been added. And then we'd refer to HG and I2 if patients deteriorate despite 19 liters of oxygen on the ward. Um, I've been part of an infection community in my hospital and a Scotland wide community. And we noticed these case reports of disseminated strong colloides in patients treated with um, steroids, high dose steroids, and tocilizumab. And so we, we felt as, as our expert opinion that we should um, try and screen for that. Where I work in central Scotland, actually in our first wave, it was a 97% Caucasian population. So not somewhere you'd think was a hot spot of strongoloides. But we decided to have our own interpretation of this um, guidelines that was um, created by the London Hospital for Tropical Medicine in, in London. It goes into two slides, um, which I'll let you look at the details um, uh, later. But essentially, we risk assess people clinically for their risk factors for having previous stronger Lordi's infection. And if they are high risk, which would be someone who is born and brought up in the tropics, 
and has spent time in rural areas, barefoot, and, and various other risk factors, then we would consider giving like, empirical ivermectin prior to their dexamethasone tocilizumab um, pending test results. And this is to prevent the possibility of sudden death with disseminated strongyloides or strongyloides hyperinfection syndrome, which can lead to gram negative sepsis and death, which would be indistinguishable, especially in our um, low prevalence population of tropical diseases, it'll be indistinguishable between someone who had a hospital acquired gram negative sepsis and sudden death. So by using this protocol in our expert opinion, um, we have treated a small number of patients with COVID with ivermectin uh, specifically to reduce their risk of strongyloides infection. We, we, and this is really my question is that I've done this as an infectious disease physician with the support of my colleagues in the, the Scottish ID community. And this has not been a problem. So ivermectin does exist in the, in the UK and you can prescribe it, it's off license and we, and we do prescribe it. I've worked as an infection doctor since 2005 in the NHS and I've prescribed it regularly and it's, it's never been questioned um, any of my prescriptions for parasitic infections or scabies. And, you know, I wonder what, what do we call this? Do we call this evidence-based medicine? There's no randomized controlled control trial data to, to support what we're doing, but I think it is evidence-based. It's, it's certainly an expert opinion. It certainly involves risk-benefit analysis and, and individual case-by-case -case, um, discussion and consent, and really respecting the autonomy of the specialists to treat a patient at risk of sudden death, but also the autonomy of the patient to have access to safe treatments that may have a real positive impact on their mortality. So really, I, I just want to use this as a stepping stone to why on earth are we not using ivermectin to treat all stages of COVID in the, in the UK and the NHS currently, where, as we've seen today, the evidence base is far superior than actually for any other reasons that we use ivermectin for. And even though it's not licensed in its oral form in the UK, it's been recommended by the WHO and it's on numerous guidelines and it has been used for decades safely and to improve patients' health, so much so that the inventor won the Nobel Prize in 2015. So I really just wanna talk about this in a slightly less um, scientific manner, but just really on an ethical kind of risk benefits, kind of clinical. I, I think of myself as a clinician predominantly who every day makes risk benefit analysis on prescribing drugs where the evidence base is often um, not complete but where there's a real potential of, of improving a patient's health and, and, and obviously a potential for harm from side effects and also the harm of not prescribing antimicrobials at the right time, particularly someone at risk of severe bacterial sepsis. And I think we need to respect the autonomy of the patient to be offered treatments that an, an expert clinician feels is of benefit, the autonomy of a, a, a consultant to offer treatments that they think is of benefits. And, I think we should quote the Hippocratic Oath and the Health Sinti Declaration as, as <clears throat> justifications for this. And I also think that if, if we presented this data to non-health professionals, patients, patients, relatives, the lay public, and I personally think this data is, is so compelling, it's very easy for anybody to understand with a little bit of teaching that most people will be thinking, why on earth are we not prescribing this? Why aren't we giving this? And rather than doctors worrying about um, prescribing an off-license medication, I, I worry about patients um, complaining, why have I not given them a safe drug which has such good data for such a marked uh, benefits on mortality and symptoms and ineffectivity? So just to summarize the risk-benefit analysis, uh, I think it's between 16 and 18 associated deaths in 3.7 billion doses for us from Dr. Tess Laurie's talk earlier. And, and this drug has been used for four decades. Um, and, and some of these deaths would have actually been association only. And some of them would have been avoidable if um, we eliminate people who've, had, who've got concurrent lower low infection or other contraindications to ivermectin. And the benefits I've briefly summarized with the data, we don't know the exact benefits for an individual, but we know on a ballpark figure that there is a 60 to 90% drop in mortality 
when looking at treating all stages of COVID. And as a clinician, as a quantitative researcher and a qualitative researcher, I believe in the concept of triangulation of data and not looking at um, a problem from one perspective on its own. I think this conference has been fantastic in showing us the data from um, real world mass epidemiological data, controlled observational trial data, which maybe we've, we've not talked about so much today, R high quality analysis of multiple randomized controlled trials and plausible me mechanism of action data. I think also listening to physicians and patient stories, I think should, should never be ignored. So for me personally, it's a, it's a no brainer, the, the risk benefit analysis, and even though there's uncertainty of the magnitude of magnitude of effect or the best dose, I noticed there's been lots of questions about the right dose. I think the honest answer is we don't know what the best dose is, but all doses that have been described today are safe and they all seem to work. And on average, the higher doses seem to, to work better. Trying to understand why it's been so difficult for this message to be understood is, is difficult, um, but personally, I think it's impossible to think about the current situation without looking through the lens of structural bias, subconscious bias of, 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 of the healthcare profession and, and people in power in the healthcare profession, and the inequity about people who suffer from COVID, which are actually often the people most disenfranchised in society. So in terms of actions that we can take from today, and I'm, I'm very keen that we, we start actions now, today, tomorrow, and, and, and I'll be taking the confidence from the data from this conference to continue my discussions about the risk benefit analysis of treating inpatients and um, in hospitals, but also in primary care of ivermectin and giving patients the opportunity to discuss whether they are, they are willing to consider an off-license medication, but also with my clinical colleagues and my local governance team and drug and therapeutics committee. And if I and the patients um, think the benefits outweigh the risks, we should, um, we should start prescribing. And I think we should use the support of myself, a network of UK prescribers who believe in prescribing ivermectin today, and quotes um, globally, the, the, the many prescribers I've met in globally and quote this conference, the BIRD website, the FLCC website, many sovereign nations and, um, and, and regions that have guidelines, that the Hippocratic Oath. And I please encourage people to email me directly as soon as possible if you want to join this movement. I, I believe that um, the fear is the only real barrier and that doctors should not fear doing the right thing based on their clinical judgments, the right thing for their patients. I think that our barriers are actually paper walls. And I think if we have the bravery to walk through them, they will, they will fall apart. And I think we are also so much stronger when we work together in unison in numbers. And I think it's, it's been, we've made real progress. And I think we need, also need, need to engage with the legal profession, like the South African doctors who've won their legal case to, to prescribe ivermectin routinely. Several US hospitals have had to prescribe ivermectin when patients and relatives have asked for that. And there's been official rollouts on many countries, including Peru, Slovakia, Czech Republic, Uttar Pradesh and India, which, and we've heard a lot about this data already. So I, again, want to thank um, everybody involved in this conference, the FLCC, the BIRD, and the bravery that they have shown, and specifically Dr. Tessa Laurie of the Bird, Pierre Corey of FLCC, and Dr. Bean. And I'd like to follow their lead. I'd like other people to follow my lead as a frontline clinician and really to spread this message to all independent healthcare professionals who value their professionalism and their patients' health. Um, I won't try and play this YouTube video just now in case it goes wrong, but it's a crazy dancing video about showing the importance of following a leader and how quickly a movement can follow that may seem crazy to, to people when it's in a minority. So you can have a look at that video later. And um, for some reason, this um, ancient um, story, which comes from Eastern religious texts, which was also written by a 19th century 
um, writer, uh, Mr. Saxon, makes me come to mind where this is the story of six blind men who are looking at an elephant from different perspectives. And by looking through their narrow senses, they mistaken what they're seeing. But to me, ivermectin, the data is so clear. We've looked at it from so many different angles. And actually, I'm sure blind men with their sense, extra sense of touch and awareness would instantly recognize that ivermectin is a drug that is safe and that it works. And it's really inexplicable how the people in authority have not been able to see this, but I'm very confident that we will change this very soon with this movement. Thank you very much for, you, for listening to me and please, any questions now or, or after the conference, please contact me directly, thank you. Dr. Medhi, thank you so much. What a beautiful presentation. Fear is the main driver. The paper, the, the wall, the barrier is a paper wall. Let's get together and work on it. I love it. Even that video, I am sure this is a video where people are on a, on a hill, I believe, and there is a, some event going on and a couple of them start dancing and then the whole group starts dancing. So thank you very much for this. Uh, if you are okay, I'm going to invite Dr. Uh, Professor Zwitter as well, and then maybe we can merge the questions together because your, uh, your presentation actually leans into the next topic very well as well, and that is the medical ethics of ivermectin's usage. So uh, let's do this. I'm going to once again thank you very much, and I'm going to uh, collate the questions together. So our next speaker, last but not least, I think this is one of the most important talks that we would hear today. That is Dr. Professor uh, Medjaz Zwitter. He is the head of Department of Medical Ethics and Law, Medical Faculty, University of Maribor, Sylvania. We talked about the rest of his bio before. He's gonna talk about ivermectin and the ethics and the law. So uh, Dr. Professor Zwitter, welcome. Ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, after two long sessions and 11 excellent presentations, I have the privilege and the difficult task to give the last talk before Dr. Said concludes our meeting. My basic speciality is oncology. Nevertheless, my main activities now are teaching and research in medical ethics. I'm most grateful to the organizers of this meeting, and especially to Dr. Tess Laurie for the invitation to speak about ethical issues in connection with the pandemic, and particularly on the role of ivermectin as a potential drug for COVID. Conflicts are a normal component of every human activity. Without conflicts, we would be a frozen society like North Korea. Yet, it is essential that the rules for resolving conflicts are clear and are respected. A football game is a conflict of two teams. Both want to win. They engage the best coach and the best players, develop their strategies and train calm. However, doping or bribing the referee or serving poisoned food to the opposite team are not allowed. Such activities would be illegal and also deeply unethical. In medicine, the situation with regards to medical ethics is more complicated. For Hippocrates, the physician and the patient were the only persons involved. In 1803, when Thomas Percival wrote his classical text on medical ethics. A third figure entered the stage, the pharmacist. Today, every activity in the field of healthcare, in one way or another, touches the interests of a wide spectrum of individuals or groups. In the case of COVID, a patient infected with this virus and his or her physician are clearly not the only persons involved. Patients with other diseases who compete for the same resources, 
other physicians and health personnel, hospital management, pharmaceutical companies, health insurance companies, healthy elderly and teenagers, they all have their legitimate interests. These interests do not overlap and may come in conflict one against the other. The COVID pandemic puts the spotlight on these conflicting interests. After every significant crisis in human history, we see losers and winners. In every war, thousands or millions of people lost their life or their property, while for some other individuals, groups, or nations, the crisis brought an opportunity to increase their wealth, influence, and power. The same is true for the COVID pandemic. Those who died of the disease or have health consequences due to long COVID are, numerically speaking, a small proportion of the overall number of people affected by the pandemic. Millions of other people feel indirect consequences of the health crisis. Lockdown measures as imposed by most governments led to severe restrictions in most areas of our societies. A list of problems and tragedies due to lockdown measures is almost endless, and so is the list of groups of our citizens who were severely hurt by the pandemics. The economic consequences of the crisis will be felt for many years. At the same time, for some segments of our societies, the health crisis brought an opportunity to increase their power and wealth. The first on the list are pharmaceutical companies, especially those involved in the production of vaccines and antiviral drugs. A significant shift of public activities to virtual events, meetings and education means a fortune for all connected to the growing business of computers, information and media technology. Due to marked increase in online shopping, Amazon and Alibaba are making fantastic revenues. In brief, this crisis, as any other crisis in the past, leads to a marked turnover on the ladder of the economic, social and political power. This holds true on an individual level, on the level of particular groups within a society, and on the global level as a shift in power of nations. As we saw during these two days, ivermectin appears to be a safe and affordable means to end this pandemic. Yet, every effort has been made to prevent the implementation of ivermectin as prophylaxis and treatment for COVID in the majority of countries. Let us see a brief and admittedly incomplete list of the obstacles. No funding for clinical trials, obstacles to publication, promotion of trials designed to produce a negative result, blocking positive information, releasing false negative information, and biased information from trusted sources, regulatory agencies, or WHO. Starting with clinical research, two elements are very obvious, funding and publication. Regarding funding, only three trials out of 22 listed by Drs. Bryant and Laurie in their recent meta-analysis, so only three out of 22 received support from pharmaceutical industries and another three from the institution. 16 trials or 72% received no support whatsoever. And then when the authors of the trials tried to, tried to publish this, they faced another obstacle. Only seven of the 22 trials were published in peer-reviewed journals. 
replying to a survey mailed by Dr. Laurie, many of the authors wrote that the manuscript was returned without any editorial comment or proper review. It's hard to avoid a feeling that for some editors, ivermectin for COVID is a prohibited topic. At the same time, when so many authors of reports on COVID and ivermectin faced uh, such a negative attitude of editors and referees, Journal of American Medical Association published a trial from Columbia, uh, which is very informative to, to go into details. Uh, this trial included relatively young patients, median age 37 years, with mild symptoms. All of them were ambulatory. Eligibility up to seven days since the first symptoms. So, so some of the patients were already in the phase of recovery. This trial, it seems, was designed to produce a negative or inconclusive result and was probably funded by pharmaceutical companies. We all know about the experience of Dr. Corey with his testimony to the Congress, which was recorded on YouTube and soon afterwards erased. His review paper on ivermectin for COVID passed through peer review and was accepted for publication in Frontiers in Pharmacology. Nevertheless, Something very strange happened. Two weeks later, Dr. Corey got a message from the editor that the paper was rejected. Dr. Hill from Liverpool had a similar experience. His report to WHO on meta-analysis of ivermectin against COVID on YouTube was quickly removed, presumably due to dangerous and misleading uh, information. Without exception, all drugs currently in use against COVID are, have weaker evidence of efficacy and are more toxic when compared to ivermectin. Yet, no other drug has received a comparable negative promotion. Food and Drug Administration issued a warning to the public against the purchase of unregistered ivermectin and the use of the product for the treatment of COVID. European Medicines Agency advises against use of ivermectin for the prevention of or treatment of COVID outside randomized clinical trials. Furthermore, they warned that side effects could increase with the much higher doses that would be needed to obtain concentrations of ivermectin in the lungs that are effective against the virus. According to WHO, the current evidence on the use of ivermectin to treat COVID is inconclusive. Until more data is available, WHO recommends that the drug only be used within clinical trials. National Institute of Health wrote that there are insufficient data to recommend either for or against the use of ivermectin for the treatment of COVID. Again, they say that results from adequately powered, well-designed and well-conducted clinical trials are needed to provide more specific evidence-based guidance on the role of ivermectin in the treatment of COVID. Finally, we have Merck, the company which sold or donated 3.8 billion of doses of ivermectin over the past four decades. Merck stated that company scientists continue to carefully examine the findings of all available and emerging studies on ivermectin for the treatment of COVID for evidence of efficacy and safety. They concluded that there is no scientific basis for potential therapeutic effect against COVID from preclinical studies, 
no meaningful evidence for clinical activity or clinical efficacy in patients with COVID and a concerning lack of safety data in the majority of studies. Should we blame only the pharmaceutical companies? I don't think so. As I said in the beginning, diverging interests are acceptable so long as the players stick to the rules. We all know that pharmaceutical companies primarily follow their commercial interests. Their slogans, such as patients' interests are our priority, do not reflect their marketing strategies. We do understand that they are not charities and that they go for profit. What is to blame, however, is that pharmaceutical companies are using channels other than usual marketing in order to pursue their goals. Influence upon information networks, on medical journals, on regulatory agencies, and on WHO as a prima facie defendant of the public rather than commercial interest, and possibly even on governments, all this is deeply unethical. The same holds true for sponsorship of trials designed to spread bias experience. Such activities are very much like bribery to the referee in a football game. We know that football is not only a game, it is also a big business, but nevertheless, uh, it, the, the game has to stick to the rules. And if we accept bribery, bribery in football, then all the excitement of the champion league is lost. And back to medicine, all the enthusiasm of doctors and nurses who are doing their best to save lives of their patients is lost in case they are not allowed to use the drugs which they consider most appropriate. In conclusion, the story of ivermectin, which we have been discussing these two days, is only a small piece in the puzzle of current pandemics. Yet, this story is a classical example on what happens if the rules are not respected. In a democratic society, our governments and public agencies should defend the rules and stand behind the public interest. The story of Ivermectin is therefore also a story about true or false democracy. Thank you very much. I'd be very glad to hear your comments. Thank you so much, Professor Zwitter. What an excellent, excellent uh, presentation. For me, the, the last statement, story of Ivermectin for COVID, is the story of true or false democracy. What a beautiful uh, way to present this. Thank you very much for clarifying a lot of uh, the, uh, some of these the anger towards big pharma. I think the clarity is great, but still I feel that there is a lack of uh, transparency there for the honesty that you asked for. So uh, a few questions uh, and this, we're, I'm gonna piggyback on Dr. Madhi's questions as well. So the first question that I have is, uh, and Dr. Zwitter, for you, Barbara Somen from, I believe she would be from Slovenia. They're saying that Dr. Zwitter, how can we approach doctors in Slovenia to prescribe us ivermectin off-label? Any recommendations? Well, <clears throat> well, we, in many countries, including Slovenia, it's not, it's not uh, an exception. Um, the majority of doctors are still be, still believe what companies and what agencies tell them, and uh, so so uh, so is the situation in our country. Uh, most doctors uh, do not simply do not believe that uh, ivermectin, since it's not registered for this indication, is effective. Uh, we know that in the past. In my field, oncology, we had every year a couple of miracle drugs, and uh, all of them, without exception, uh, proved to be to be uh, just uh, false hopes. 
And uh, some doctors, or maybe many doctors, think that ivermectin is again one just uh, such a miracle drug, which if properly tested, will uh, will be proven to be ineffective and of no no benefit. I'm very sure that it's not the case, but um, I don't know why doctors do not go for the documents. Uh, on the web, there are so many, so many uh, documents showing that uh, ivermectin really works. The other problem, of course, is that ivermectin in our country, uh, well, it is registered, but you can't get it in pharmacies. So quite a few doctors and also lay people told me recently that they bought ivermectin from Bulgaria, from Greece, from India. Uh, and so I think this is, this is a bad situation when, when uh, people start using the drug, which is, uh, well, it should, be, it should be regulated. I think we should press on the government to answer the question more briefly. We should press on the government to uh, allow this drug either for routine use or to start a big trial. I, I'm proposing a trial now for a couple of weeks and pressing on all the, all the buttons of the, of the government to, to let us start a trial where we would, similar to what Dr. Schwartz uh, showed at the beginning of today's presentations, uh, a trial for, for early COVID-infected patients where we would compare uh, ivermectin to placebo in a double-blind randomized trial, and we hope to get uh, at least 1,000 patients. We have a lot of patients, so you we can it. do it. Uh, and that would be really an achievement. So you maybe that it. would be a way how to do it. I, I do support a clinical trial, not just some wide prescriptions. Got it. Thank you very much for that answer. Uh, Dr. Methi, I have a question for you as well. So there's a question from one of the audience members. So are you stating that the UK MDs have the prescribing power to write for ivermectin and that for fear they have not, has been the problem? I think the short answer is, is yes. Um, like I said, I prescribed ivermectin recently. I prescribed it every year since 2005. Um, I prescribe it because it's in my opinion, risk-benefit analysis and that's of my team. I think the slight difference with prescribing it with COVID is it's the first time that I'd be doing that as a, a minority, because as has been described here, my belief that it, it works on the risk-benefit analysis is not the majority opinion of doctors in Scotland. But I think that minority position will change very quickly if I start prescribing it, patients get better, other people watch this conference and realize that um, just following recommendations from the WHO and the EMA is not how we practice medicine. We, we routinely practice do drugs that we don't wait for approval from the WHO on a case-by-case -case basis, on a compassionate basis, on the expert opinion, risk-benefit analysis of patient and doctor autonomy. Absolutely. I think we can prescribe it. And when we prescribe it, the NHS will have to source it. And when the demand goes up, they'll have to find better sources. There's currently lots of ivermectin in ID units around the country, which are not being used because we don't have a lot of tropical diseases in, in Scotland. Got it. Um, that's not really the issue. The issue is that we're not prescribing it and we're not making the case. Got it. Thank you very much for that. And one more question to each of you, and then uh, we'll move towards the next steps. So Dr. Mehdi, first uh, to you, uh, the prescription to cohorts that you have been giving ivermectin. So the question is, what, are, what were the relative res results compared to other patients? Did you do any analysis? So I, I work in, a, in an area that probably has the lowest incidence of tropical diseases in, in anywhere else that I've worked previously. So the numbers were less than five. So I don't really want to make any scientific conclusions from that, but I am hoping to link in with other centers in Scotland, UK wide, so we can compare the outcomes of patients who've been given live medicine for this reason with appropriate kind of case control uh, data. But anecdotally, we only gave a, a low dose once, 0.2 milligrams per kilogram once. And um, anecdotally, um, patients had an improvement in the oxygen requirements at 24 hours, but then they often had a deterioration thereafter, which would fit 
with the idea that we, we probably need to give a higher dose and um, more often. And it also fits that perhaps in severe disease, um, ivermectin is less effective than it is in, in earlier disease. And that's, um, you know, really Got we it. should be before hospital. Got it. Thank you very much. And, and one more question for you, Dr. Uh, Professor Zwitter. So Barbara Simone says, thank you for your answer. There is a lot of Slovenian ready to help with the pressure in the government, what can we do? And if I can tag on my question on top of that as well, that when WHO comes out and uses, cherry picks some parts of these studies and says, hey, this is not useful, don't do it. How, not only just one country's government, how do we create a pressure on such organizations as well? What is the, the way to move forward? Well, for, for WHO, I don't know. I really don't know it. Uh... Uh, I don't think that they are a transparent um, organization uh, and uh, they would, they are probably, at least for individual doctors, they, we can't do much, I think. What we can do is just show in every single country that they are wrong and then they will have to, to admit that they are wrong. They, they will not do it otherwise. Uh, so every, if one country after the other, makes a cl clinical trial and and proves that this drug really works then within a couple of months we can change the the, the whole uh, situation so yeah. uh, again I, I yes please um well personally i do not think that clinical trials are the way to go because there's enough evidence and i think if one is if one is going to then go and try and conduct clinical trials in every country when we already have enough evidence to show that ivermectin probably reduces deaths by a huge amount. Um, I think we are actually complicit and we're playing their game because their game is calling for these. And, and what that is doing is killing more people, pushing the, uh, kicking the ball down the, the, the road further. Uh, and, uh, and in the meantime, causing a lot of harm. So I think we really need to stand together and say, Enough is enough. We have enough evidence and we have to work. Perhaps it is country by country and we we focus our efforts on that country to persuade the authorities so that we get the ball rolling and we get ivermectin to all the, all the countries we can as quickly as possible. Randomized trials take a long time. I and totally... then at this rate, we're not even managing to get our trials published. Look at all the trials that are on the preprint service. So I think there's an agenda that we can't um, beat by playing the game that they want us to play that is controlled by a big farmer. So th that is a very keen observation, Dr. Laurie. Absolutely. We have enough data already. I was talking with Dr. Pierre Khori last night and we were talking about ivermectin and he used a statement which was beautiful. He said, for ivermectin, the efficacy results have become proven, period. We're done. Now is the time to start seeing how do we make uh, ourselves and doctors and how do we get to a point where we can start using it. So Dr. Lori, uh, this actually brings us to a wrap as well. Uh, any last comments before I can uh, share how the, the audience can see the uh, videos and how do we move forward? Okay, as long as there's no more pressing uh, questions, then I will, I will wrap up and, uh, and close the meeting. So yes, so we are good. Thank you very much, Dr. Zwitter, for your talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Methi, for your talk. So we, we have, I think, answered more than 410 questions. Uh, we are very fortunate that you have done this. Thank you so very much. Any, any comments from you? Dr. Lori. Okay. Um, well, I mean, firstly, I would just like to thank all the esteemed speakers of today and yesterday. And also the many clinician researchers around the world who have actually studied ivermectin for COVID and who are not at this conference. Your valuable research, clinical experience and expert opinion have provided the key that we need to turn this pandemic around. To our amazing chair, Dr. Bean, I'm so grateful that we've had your wisdom, humor and generosity of spirit to guide our discussions this weekend. And from the bottom of my heart, I thank you, Dr. Bean. I am, it, it is a pleasure to be here. I am honored to, to be for this opportunity. Thank you very much for that. To the wonderful participants from every continent and many, many countries, thank you for your engagement throughout this two-day conference, the stimulating discussions, 
and also the support you've shown through your kind donations, which amount to almost £10,000. These funds will help to support the Birds Group's ongoing efforts to get ivermectin available for all. And a big thank you to our technical team, Rob, Mark and Ronan, who've kept things running smoothly over the course of these two days. But before we end, I would like to share with you a few reflections on ivermectin and the state of affairs with regard to evidence-based medicine. As a scientist tasked with providing evidence along evidence-based medicine principles, I have become aware that the hierarchical approach to evidence synthesis where systematic reviews sit at the top of the evidence pyramid and expert opinion and consensus at the bottom is no longer appropriate. This is partly because the integrity of systematic reviews and meta-analysis has become degraded by the increasing requirements about the conduct of randomized controlled trials, the considered gold standard of clinical studies that favor the pharmaceutical industry. Large randomized trials have become hugely resource intensive 70-page trial protocols and grant applications require months of time and expertise to jump through all the hoops required for processing and authorization. In addition, they cost millions of dollars. These requirements play into the hands of Big Pharma, who are the only ones who can afford such trials. Large randomized clinical trials of generic medicines and non-pharmaceutical interventions, which deserve to be evaluated for a number of viral and cancerous conditions, are rare because frankly, there is no money to be made and there is no funding available. In my experience of evaluating trial reports of novel anti-cancer agents, it is common that early trial findings showing benefit leading to the drug's approval are contradicted by later evidence showing no benefit. By then the drug has already been licensed for use and the pharmaceutical company has already made billions. For this reason, I caution against the unquestioning acceptance of data provided by the developers of novel treatments and strongly suggest these need independent evaluation. Not by academics and institutions receiving unlimited research grants and funding from the pharmaceutical industry and their associated fund companies and charities, but by independent objective scientists with no conflicts of interest. It is time we recognize and scrutinize the involvement of industry and institutions once known for their scientific integrity and all the so-called public-private partnerships and charitable foundations that have facilitated the corruption of science and our honorable profession healing. They who design the trials and control the data also control the outcome. So this system and focus of industry, industry-led trials needs to be put to an end. Data from ongoing and future trials of COVID, tre COVID treatments must be independently controlled and analyzed. Anything less than total transparency cannot be trusted. With regard to the evidence pyramid, there needs to be a new approach, an integrated evidence approach, instead of a tiered hierarchical approach. Instead of a pyramid, in my opinion, a circle would be more appropriate, where the center represents the integrated body of evidence from different sources. Systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized trials would then represent one of, of several types of evidence, including observational studies, real-world data, qualitative data on people's views and experiences, and doctor's expert opinion. This would inform clinical practice decision-making in a much more holistic way. All of these different types of data are critical to the big picture and integration of these data has been absent in the evaluation of all interventions imposed on the public over the course of the last year. Instead, authorities have cherry picked science and the scientists to support their flawed decision-making processes. The story of ivermectin has highlighted that we are at a remarkable juncture in medical history, where rigorous scientific evidence 
our training and experience, the tools that we use to heal and our connection with our patients are being systematically undermined by relentless disinformation stemming from corporate greed. The story of ivermectin shows that we as a public have misplaced our trust in the authorities and have underestimated the extent to which money and power corrupts. Had ivermectin been employed in 2020, when medical colleagues around the world first alerted the authorities to its efficacy, millions of lives could have been saved and the pandemic with all of the associated suffering and loss brought to a rapid and timely end. Since then, hundreds of millions of people have been involved in the largest medical experiment in human history, mass vaccination with an unproven novel therapy. Hundreds of billions will be made by Big Pharma and paid for by the public. With politicians and other non-medical individuals dictating to us what we are allowed to prescribe to the ill, we as doctors have been put in a position such that the ability, our ability to uphold our Hippocratic Oath is under attack. At this fateful juncture, we must therefore choose. Will we continue to be held ransom by corrupt organizations, health authorities, big pharma, and billionaire sociopaths? Or will we do our moral and professional duty to do no harm and always do the best for those in our care? The latter includes urgently reaching out to colleagues around the world to discuss which of our tried and tested safe older medicines can be used against COVID, holding medical forums free of conflict of interest like this one, and banding together as health professionals to stand up to the medical tyranny that has been imposed on us and the public over the past year. To this end, I suggest we form a new World Health Organization, a health organization that represents the interests and well being of the people, not corporations and billionaires. An organization focused on optimizing human health and potential, not contraception and population control. A people centered organization. And never before has our role as doctors been more important because never before have we been complicit in potentially causing so much harm. I ask all doctors here today to look into their hearts and remember their oath so that we can move forward united in the protection of those we serve and with the greatest of courage. Thank you. Dr. Lori, thank you very much for your statement. Uh, I am sure that this, this will be available in writing. Many of the audience members are asking for it. You brought me to tears, so I had to hold myself back many, many times. This is a great idea that we need a new organization. And I just am I'm speechless at the words that you just spoke. Thank you very much for your statement. Thank you very much for conducting, organizing, orchestrating this whole um, conference as well. Thank you very much for bringing to light the knowledge that is needed for a healthcare professional to use to know I should practice this, I can practice this, and I can save lives, and I'm not under the fear. So thank you for lifting the fear from the healthcare professionals. So with this, thank you everyone in the BIRD group as well. Thank you very much to the administration group. I am going to share my screen and show the uh, conference and how do we reach out to our audience. So this is the International Ivermectin for COVID Conference, 24 and 25th, April, 2021. The group is BIRD, British Ivermectin Recommendation Development. In here, um, so if you wanted to join us for, to spread the word, these are the hashtags, Ivermectin, Ivermectin Conference 21, effective, safe, cheap. Twitter is at Bird Group UK. The site is bird-group.org. You can also help donate. You can see that the, the sites that are opposing, the sites that are suppressing are powerful, they're mighty. And here there are, small organizations, people just coming together 
to try to help save humanity in this dark and evil time. So if you wanted to donate, if you wanted to support this work, bird-group.org, donate. And also make sure that you join the mailing list, bird-group.org. Over there, there is a button to join the mailing list and please do that. The website of note, the British Ivermectin Recommendation Development Group, the BIRD group, bird-group.org, the Frontline COVID-19 Critical Care Alliance here in the US, FLCCC. So they are covid19criticalcare.com. If you are looking for prophylaxis or dosage information, please uh, see that site as well. Ivermectin for COVID-19 real-time meta-analysis of 2052 studies is the ivmmeta.com. So with this, a final announcement that United Health Alliance would have one more conference next month, 23rd of May. So please join us for an update and to help fill some of the knowledge gaps on 23rd May at 3.15 GMT. So this would be the next discussion. Thank you once again very much for everyone to be here. The recording of this video will be available soon and the BIRD group will be tweeting that out as well. And once again, thank you everyone for your time and for learning and for saving humanity. Bye-bye for now.